Okay, we're back. Welcome, everybody. We'll try to stay awake for the next couple hours while you guys talk about it. Um, so we, anything else? We, I think we're on letter number five, right? Anything else on letter number five? Any further questions? Seeing now, let's move on to letter number six. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll, I'll pick it up here for letter number six. Uh, this is related to the mineral royalty grant funding uh, program and um, the governor is proposing that uh, we get that program back up to um, 16 million for the remainder of the biennium. Uh, the last biennium prior to this, there was $32 million in that program. And the governor believes um, strongly that it's a good uh, tool for um, helping out our, our local communities to navigate situations that are um, very pressing for them and to help them with with infrastructure needs. Um, and as the governor spoke to you all, uh, um, I think there were some discussions around the, the definition of what an emergency is that would qualify for an MRG program and then um, uh, where this funding has gone in the past. So the um, Office of State Lands and Investments team is here. If you've got any specific questions, again, this uh, is an area that's very important to um, Governor Gordon to have this funded as we move forward, I think the, the um, lesson from the past year is as well, there are, are plenty of federal dollars through the American Rescue Plan Act um, that are available to local communities. Um, the qualifications and uses of those dollars um, don't match up with the, the MRG in the way that that had been used by local communities. So um, again, just to ask for a $10 million from the general fund for the MRG program and the $6 million that was to be um, intercepted from that uh, would stay to keep that level at 16 million for the uh, remainder of the biennium. So <clears throat> remind us, Rennie, the, the sweep that um, was created, and my recollection is that in the defunding of this over time was driven a lot by the amount of available dollars. And, you know, it, you got to take money from somewhere to, to cover our underlying obligations. But what's your recollection? Go, no, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, part of the issue was, uh, as was, we saw some reduced revenues a few years ago, we removed some funding from the Business Ready Community Program. And uh, as this committee saw it, there was quite a bit of overlap between the types of projects that were being funded between those two programs. And so we shifted money out of the mineral royalty grant program into the business ready community program to keep that uh, funding level at, at the roughly $30 million because it was going to go well below that from its previous highs. And so uh, this is where the, this committee and the legislative body saw a place to find the funds that were doing very similar things for communities throughout the state. And, and that's where that shift took place and why this fund is currently at a lower level than it was historically. Well, it would be worthwhile in commenting on that as well. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Walters, I mean, I, th I think that that's accurate. I think, however, I, I think, I think, have you, I think you have already visited with Josh Durrell of the Business Council. And so I think you're starting to see those types of community development grants, and those types of things that created those similar opportunities have, there's been a significant shift there. And so I don't think you're seeing the overlap that happens there. I think uh, Chairman Kinski had also commented the fact that, you know, these MRGs used to be for smaller communities and, and there was come some kind of a shift away from that as, as larger communities maybe elbowed their way to the table on that. However, you know, we, we continue to find those things. It can be anything. And I think also, if you remember back, there was a lot of discussion about with the, uh, with the uh, medical facility grants in, in, from ARPA and additionally the water, the water funding, the water grants that went out, that there was also, that was also was part of the zeroing out. We thought that there was a lot of money that would be available for those types of things. However, there still needs to be back to Rennie's point. There still are a number of, uh, of things that happen that don't qualify for ARPA. It can be anything from a blown out irrigation canal to a broken down uh, ambulance that, that some small community can't replace, maybe a county bridge, 
um, is uh, is hit. Maybe a you know the one example also was the lining of the water tank had caved in, and they're just in some of these small towns and 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 and, and least populated counties don't have much of an opportunity to respond, and there's no other place really in a lot of that for them to go to have the ability to do that. So this is an attempt to uh, provide some discretionary uh, funds to the, the governor and the slip board so that they can address uh, those needs. And, and, I, and I think that we're seeing that development. I think that there's been a little bit of, a, again, a change on some of the duplication. Um, so we also have, if, there's, if you have questions about specific grants or anything in the past, we've got our, our friends from OSLI here that can Talk about that. I don't. As, uh, hopefully, that answers the questions. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we do have OSLI here, I would look at the fiscal year 22 uh, South Bighorn County Hospital District Certified Electronic Health Record System. Uh, I see where that benefits a small district. Not sure that I see it as an emergency. Not sure as I see it as something that shouldn't be handled from their own internal types of funds. And I use that as an example of. Uh, are these funds, why there was concern on the legislative side that these funds were maybe not being used as judiciously as possible, but rather just a, another place that, any, that locals could come for money so they didn't have to, to uh, pony up where they should have been planning for these kind of upgrades. So I did, that's just one, one example off the 2022 list. You may answer. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> uh or Chairman Nicholas, uh, Representative Walters. The way I look at MRG is OSLIs, the vetting uh, part for SLIB. We go through the application. We make sure it's eligible. We make sure we have all the information. Um, and then we can make a recommendation to SLIB. However, SLIB doesn't always take our recommendations. And so um, it's truly a case-by-case -case basis. I feel like OSLI staff, especially last biennium when we had $13 million the last two years, we were very um, conservative with our definition of an emergency. In the 10 years that I've been in the office, uh, Prior to that, if a system broke, whether, whether it was due to lack of maintenance or whatever, it was considered an emergency. Um, in the last 10 years, we backed off from that in the sense that deferred maintenance, your lack of doing what you need to do doesn't always constitute an emergency and doesn't always mm -hmm. receive emergency uh, funding. Since... Um, Biennium 1516, uh, we received 70 emergency applications. 54 of them were funded. And in that same time period, we received 403 applications total, um, totaling over $228 million. Uh, over $228 million. Of those 403 applications, we funded 20, 270 of them for a total of $87 million. One thing we try to make sure that we do is um, we try to keep in contact with awardees who receive these funds so that um, when there's a little bit of money left on their app, uh, grant or when it looks like their project is complete, we work with them so that they can relinquish those funds and we can work and send those out on another project. So it's not unusual for us to, for lack of a better term, award a dollar more than once because the original awardee didn't use it. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have a defined definition of emergency or is it Case by case emergency. There's, there's OSLI when you're looking at these. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, the uh, I believe the statute as well as our rules define an emergency as an immediate and direct threat to the human, to humans' health and safety and welfare in that community. Okay, 
Any other questions? Seeing none. Any other questions on the letter? John, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just before you leave, uh, note that uh, $6 million was not included in the governor's profile or your uh, advanced materials that you've been working on. So you will see a, a $6 million increase or decrease in the general fund balance going forward. Based upon the letter, you mean? Based upon the letter, correct. Mm -hmm. And, but do we have to act for that $6 million to be available? Um, correct. That you will actually need to delete last year's, I believe it's section 300 G N, excuse me, 300 N, and uh, strike that language. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Please? Mr. Chairman, uh, final question. I don't see it here, and maybe I just have missed it in my reading. Is this plan to be ongoing, one time, biennialized? What is the intent of this request? Because the M MRG program, is laid out for 17, for 10, for five. Mr. Chairman, it's one time. Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't hear what Kevin said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have it on the profile as the $10 million would be one time. And I believe the $6 million only would exist at a one time as well. So it's one time. So it'll, it, w it won't become ongoing until next year. Mr. Chairman, that's predicated on next year's budget discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think you can anticipate that the, the governor and SLIB will, <laughs> will probably request additional money in the M MRG uh, a year from now. But, uh, <laughs> but as we know... Uh, um, Remind us, um, how much has the MRG fund been made of, how much over the past, like, three or four biennium. What was the funding? Um, Mr. Chairman, prior to a couple bienniums ago, the standard budget was $33.4 million, off of which we took uh, admin costs off the top. Um, last year, uh, so for biennium 21-22, the standard appropriation within our budget is $25,400,000. We take off our administration costs. Then you take out the lack of coal lease bonuses, which is a, over $11 million. Then in addition to that, we take off our drinking water match requirement for the SRF program. So that left us with $12,851,811. That was last biennium. So the immediate biennium before that, it was at 33. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the biennium before that was uh, basically $22.3 million. That's, that's my record. Okay. okay, further questions? All right. Next letter. Mr. Chairman, uh, letter number seven builds off of, of uh, letter number six. Again, this is reflective of the governor's um, belief in, in uh, supporting our communities and, and having strong, thriving communities as we go forward. So um, he is asking for, uh, um, on top of the 105 million in direct distribution, uh, to add 26 million from the general fund for cities, towns, and counties using the, the existing direct distribution model. Um, there is a caveat here, the governor is flagging um, both for uh, your consideration and for um, local communities is, is that with the proposal related to the employer contribution, which includes local um, cities, towns, and counties, that they should be considering, um, and this proposal is just to help kind of glide path towards that employer contribution that impacts them. Um, so uh, that they should be using this as they plan their budgets for the future. Um, our, our cities, towns, and counties have also benefited from, from increased revenues as well, but this would help them um, with that employer contribution going forward as they plan to, to include that and then to look to see if they can provide any support to um, their um, subsidiaries or other local entities that are having to cover the employer contribution increase 
um, that he's uh, proposing to deal with the fund ratio balance of the public employees plan. So that's the the addition there. And all of this, again, comes back to um, just tr uh, trying to emphasize that that having strong uh, communities with good infrastructure uh, is what's going to help us um, make the entire state stronger, help with uh, livability and quality of life. Um, I think we're all realizing how much we we rely on our communities and how much as they're they're growing right now that we need uh, good infrastructure but he is flagging this as I think you all have in the past that um that, that the local communities should not count on this um, as an increased funding that would be ongoing that 105 um, has been the baseline for a while now and and that this is uh, possible only because of our huge surplus and remind me um Don, how much was it funded last year? Mr. Chairman, yeah, it is at uh, uh, 59.75, I believe. Um, 52.5 million is under the traditional, what I'll call Madden formula. And that of course is 105 million for the biennium. And then um, the legislature added 15 million, 7.5 million per year. Um, so the sum of those two is the 59.75. So it was 120. 120 total. So this takes the 120 up to, um, yeah, 146. Correct. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rennie, you, <clears throat> well, we had a couple of funding models. You got the Madden model, and then we had a, in the supplemental one, we kind of had a, a tweak to, direct a little more to smaller communities. You guys, had, as you drafted the letter, have you considered, were you just basically planning on using the, we call it the enhanced Madden model with what had the B, we've used for several years, or did you want it just interested in your, your thoughts on the distribution? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think the, the what the governor was, was favoring was the more traditional funding model. If you're calling that the enhanced Madden model, the one that has been exist prior to last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure if that's the new and improved Madden model, the enhanced Madden model, yeah. which, which <laughs> Madden model that would be and without the professor here to fix it. I we call it the Madden slash B-belt model. <laughs> 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 okay, um, go ahead, Senator Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so can you tell me, does this take into consideration other than an increase, some of the, our smaller communities, you know, Dubois, Pavilion, those, those really small communities, does it, is it just a straight increase for every township and municipality or is there a mechanism where it does help additionally some of our smaller towns? So Don, I think that would be helpful. Tell us what that advanced Madden, model is, and I think it's a direct payment of a minimum to all small communities. Um, Mr. Chairman, while I'm speaking, uh, LSO staff will um, distribute um, a three columns uh, scenario, essentially. We have the enhanced MAD model. And the only thing enhanced about that is um, the base amount that is going to every community except two. I think there are two communities that, uh, qualify for additional funds, Van Tassel, anything under 15, I think pop, population Van Tassel and Lost Springs, as I recall. Um, this does have what is referred to as a hardship component um, to it. And um, it takes into account the per capita, the ability to raise taxes on themselves, the per capita assessed valuation, primarily for counties um, and on the municipal side, primarily, uh, the per capita uh, sales and use tax. There is ad valorem on the municipal side and sales tax on the county side, but the driving force is reversed. Um, the uh, additional $15 million, um, which is in, I believe, the second column um, of the handout here, um, this was unique in that it was a separate distribution so um, to Senator Salazar's question, all of the smaller communities, uh, municipalities benefited from that because they got that base amount twice. That was the Hicks model, I believe. That Senator Hicks uh, um, 
advocated for that, correct. <laughs> um, on the county side, um, the, legis uh, the uh, model advocated by Senator Hicks last year, um, it really wasn't the size of the county, it was more the wealth um, related to the county. Um, and then just for um, uh, comparison purposes, we put in a difference. So you can see that typically the larger communities, Casper, Sheridan, um, Rock Springs, Laramie, will do better under um, the base model as opposed to the um, modified model from last year. And on, uh, on, the, on the counties, excuse me, the um, wealthier counties do well or do you know somewhat better under the base model, the first column of numbers, as opposed to um, the second column of numbers, which gives them a little bit of additional um, help on a per capita basis. Okay, thank you for the hand on, it's useful. All right, any other questions? Mr. Chairman? Please. I think if you, if you go back to uh, about uh, 2000, uh, 2009, that you could probably find three more that now Treasurer Meyer put in among Treasurer Meyer used to come up with some really good ones too. So he wasn't uh, Representative Madden was the pre the pre wasn't the old mad scientist did it. <laughs> I know Don burned a lot of Don Richard burned a lot of midnight oil back then trying to work on some of those spreadsheets. <laughs> Representative Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so Mr. Chief of Staff, I like like that. Um, or just, end, just chief. For chief. Sure. Hey, chief. Um, <laughs> I noticed at the end of the letter, the governor asks that it be used for one-time infrastructure. And I, I only bring this up because um, back when I was a commissioner, that there was uh, monies being allocated for infrastructure to local governments. And the problem became you kept building new infrastructure, but you didn't have any money to do maintenance. So I just want to make sure that the governor's office is aware that maintenance is often more critical than developing new infrastructure. Chairman, I, I think that's that's always that is always the question as you do this stuff. That's why it's simply a recommendation for uh, communities to remember to do that. And, and as you go across the state, that uh, the good representative Schwartz and I were county commissioners a long time ago at the same time. And, and it's all, it all, you know, maintenance is always an issue. And so we look at one-time investments, um, you know, so I think, I think the main concern there is that you, is not to put this into ongoing operations. I mean, we talk about uh, particularly why the, the 105 has been around for a while. Um, you know, obviously we've got some bumps because of the good times here to increase, increase that. So again, um, we all know how volatile all it is. And so um, going back to those discussions a long time ago, it's, it, you know, when the state has wealth, it shares the wealth with its uh, political subdivisions and its cities, towns, and counties. Um, when it doesn't, it that becomes more problematic. And so it's just a reminder to, uh, to the extent possible, again, and sometimes those major maintenance or other deferred maintenance things, these are great monies to deal with that issue but uh, obviously it's up it, these are essentially block granted out to our local communities and uh, and how they spend it is up to them so don could you remind us when did these start and what's the highest we paid and what's the, the least amount we paid for, for biennium if that's readily attainable um mr chairman i'll um Pause here and see if Taylor can pull up the history on the on the data book. Um, I think the lowest is 105 million, which we're currently paying, um, and I believe that the high was around uh, 275 or so. 275 per, per biennium. Oh yeah. Um, and he will have to to check. You you previously had a um, an additional component to the model, which was called the county consensus funding which means all of the municipalities in the county had to get get together. And um, I think it was, if my memory serves, 75% of them had to agree on a particular slate of projects. Um, that's been entirely done away with. But if you include that amount, um, the, the total contribution was um, a couple hundred million. Mr. Mr. Chairman, 
Um, in addition, I, I just to, to stress that a little bit, and back that when it was that year that it was 275, 275, that's my recollection, was 275 to 265. And I actually got split into two accounts. There were in, there, there was a, I think if I remember right, about 160 million set aside for impact, minerally impacted counties. It was during one of the big booms. And then and then there was a and, and so certain counties qualified into that pool. And you know, there was another hundred million that was for counties that were not necessarily impacted by that mineral boom. And so mm -hmm. together. Those ended up being local distributions, but every county had to be in one or other of those two pools. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. And as this really came into effect in the 2006, 2007, as the food tax was removed, and in a lot of these small communities, the only revenue they had was sales tax at their local convenience store. And when that was removed, it caused some hardships. And so uh, they came to the state, and this was the state's solution. Okay, further questions? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Ocho. letter number eight. <laughs> uh, so this is related to a proposal uh, to study the Colorado River hydrology in the uh, river basins in Wyoming that feed the Colorado River. Um, this is a critical time uh, for Wyoming to make sure that, and, and fortunately, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're fortunate to be able to have some funding to take on um, some of the pressing challenges facing Wyoming and, and this uh, very significant drought is one of them. Um, and especially as we try to determine um, some of the impacts and, and how uh, the management of the Colorado River is, is changing and will change into the future. So um, other states in the upper uh, Colorado River Basin are already ahead of us on this, of doing this modeling um, of the hydrology. And so um, the governor believes that it's it's very important to make this investment um, so that we can get this modeling in place um, for Wyoming, as well as uh, as we look at the, the rest of the basin and, and uh, understand um, what we may be facing uh, on this front. And I will flag for you that the state engineer, Brandon Gephardt, is, is here on Zoom. He is working on the Colorado River issue right now at a multi-state meeting um, in Nevada. So appreciate that he was able to still break away from that to join us uh, so he'd be able to, to help on this front. But um, if you have any questions um, on the specifics of um, this study and what the modeling would and would not do, um, he's available, but uh, just wanna emphasize again that the governor believes very strongly that this is an important area for us to focus on. And, and we are um, very fortunate to have some resources we can put towards this right now. So I, I, a lot of our questions I think were already answered. Um, when we had him before us on the on the agency, but just quickly, um, how did you come up with the five hundred thousand? Number one, and number two, how how quickly will you hire someone, and how long will it take them to put the model together? Mr. Chairman, I defer to the state engineer helped us with this, so I defer to Mr. Gephardt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the 500,000 uh, was derived from discussions with folks in the basin who are performing this, as well as the UCRC. Um, and I, the question I asked them is how much would it take to start standing up a model for Wyoming? Uh, from your knowledge of, of the size of our basin and the intricacies of our system and um, the general consensus was that this 500,000 was, a, was a, a good number to start with. Uh, I do anticipate that um, once we get the model established, that we will be, uh, our staff internally will, will be running the model and continuing to refine it and, and create additional resolution in the model as we go forward. But this, this would be the initial step to set it up and get a running functional model uh, before we started. Uh, the, the resolution uh, that, that our staff would do. Um, and I apologize, I missed the part of the second question. Well, I'm just curious how long, if, if it sounds like you may have already started down this road a little bit, but how long will it take them to compile the information to have a, a working model? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, that, that is a good question. We've been talking to uh, modelers uh, who, who specialize in the type of model um, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the modelers that do this are already working for other states. So 
we are uh, talking to two that could potentially be interested in this. And so we would have to first establish the contract with them, which we would uh, we would start immediately once the funding is available. Uh, we'd start the conversations we already have, but um, and then to establish uh, to set up the model. I don't have a good feel for that. There is a lot of uh, data that needs to go into it that that our field folks have, and some that we would still have to go acquire and put into it. So it it's at least a year, I would say, potentially longer. Further questions for the director? Okay, seeing none, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just to follow up on that final sentence of your answer, Mr. Gebhardt, uh, at least a year to what? To start the contract, to start the model, to start seeing information, at least a year to what point of that is, I guess, what uh, I'm missing. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm thinking that the, the first year we would have a fully functional model that would be up and running. And then uh, we would be, then this would be an ongoing tool that we would use through for administration, for a curtailment call, uh, for, for many purposes. Uh, we would use it to uh, either confirm or refute modeling done by other states as well. Uh, so it'll be an ongoing tool that we would use for quite a few years, for many years, I would say. So, and Mr. Director, to follow up on that, essentially these will become our experts um, to address the various um, issues as they arise as we move down this, this phase of litigation and, and working a resolution to the Colorado River. Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what I envisioned, that these, these would be experts that we would uh, be on call with and, and answer asking questions and getting answers that would help us through throughout as long as long as the money's intact. Director, can you remind us things have moved a little fast for me? Um, did you have a supplemental request for an additional employee? It seems like you did to help with this whole effort. And if you did, is that sufficient? Mr. Chairman, we did uh, last year, um, the, the legislature did give us an additional employee and we have been advertising that for a little over four months at least. And we have yet to fill that. Um, we didn't get a, a silver bullet applicant, so we're still continuing. Um, one of the things that we may consider uh, is expanding the, or maybe made, moving the position, offering it back into Cheyenne to see if we can increase our application pool a little bit. Um, but that is something that we would work with the, the governor's office to make, make sure he was comfortable with that as well. Um, but we have not hired that. And to, to your question, I think for now, um, we're hopeful that, it's, that it will be enough uh, between him and our additional our existing staff, uh, but things will, as things continue to speed up, um, it's tough to keep pace of what our needs are going to be. And so for now, I'm comfortable with what we've asked for, and we may be back in front of you next budget session as well, depending on the speed of things. And then you, Mr. Uh, Director Gephardt, you also um, suggested that as soon as the money was allocated, you'd like to start as, I mean, are you, of the opinion we should have been started yesterday. And if you had the funds, you would be, which would then lead to a question is, do you have the ability, do we have the ability to be 11 within your agency to allow you to get started with that and then backfill with these if we uh, if we move forward with it? I'm just, Mr. I guess my question is, is, is how, how serious is the urgency? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the urgency is is upon us. Um, we should have started this yesterday, the day before, a month ago, years ago. Um, but I, I do believe that that we are uh, behind all the other states, uh, particularly with this effort. So I I would appreciate any flexibility we can get to expedite this as much as we can. So in that in that vein, I'm I'm just curious. 
seems to me that the governor's office could use some of his available discretionary revenues to get to launch this thing to so we don't have to wait till even April 1st to retain somebody or to go through this this process because I think we all concur that the sooner the better Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, we don't have that funds. Uh, we do not have five hundred thousand dollars in that contingency fund. It was at four hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty of it is um, used, and in your budget proposal, you'd be bringing that two hundred fifty back. Um, so we, we can work with the state engineer's office to see if there's some means to um, use the first installment of that. But to the point we talked about with contracting on on buildings. Um, we, no, I, we, we I, don't have the full amount to I enter into a five hundred thousand dollars an emergency. You got you got two hundred you got twenty million dollars. So you know, or other. I mean, there, there, there ought to be some place to find this money. That I'm just, Mr. Chairman, and, and I think that that brings up a very good point, and that is, in some of in some instances, the emergency money we have, I think, is maybe has maybe too tight a sideboard. Um, it's up to the legislature about what discretion you would give the governor office to do anything with that, but. I mean, there, there. I mean, there is, there is certainly money in the office to to do some things immediately. But, um, um, you know, I think that the lack of direction or concern about flexibility and and overstepping the, the discretion with which was vested in the original language is significant. And so, um, but you're but you're right. I think there. I mean, there is you know the twenty million dollars emergency funding, but you know it's a public health or safety emergency. And it, it may be a bit of a stretch. Well, it may not be a bit of a stretch for some of the members of this committee. It may be a bit of a stretch for other members of, of the legislature. That, that's a bit of an abuse of authority. And, and we'd hate to be in a situation where we've abused, where there's a perception that we've abused the trust the legislature has given the governor. Well, and I'm curious. It seems to me that there are, there are other funds that the B11 may be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for NERPA would be another example. Of, but, and they're just replacement dollars that well, we could figure it out. We'll, we'll let you <clears throat> see what you can come up with. Well, we have, we have a very good budget director who can use those superpowers for good, and we can do that. It's just, uh, we, we, you know, we, it's, uh, um, and, and, but it's an, it's an important issue. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, we need to get started, we, and we can work back if, if with the money's granted and we can replace it. We could replace for NERP or something later on. That's 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 great, but I don't think the the people who and the from there, there's a lot going on. If you look at the Ashley Forest Plan, if you look at all the forest plans, the land range land use management plans, and the the, the state is under assault from a lot of directions, and so there's a lot of demand on for NERPA. So front loading it from for NERPA would be great, but but it's. But ultimately, the FNRPA money will be needed during the biennium. I believe it needs to be available to continue the, the, the assaults and, and to continue to have those discussions with our federal partners that we need to have. From well, let's, let's just back in from a, a different standpoint. I think it's, it would behoove us to find some language on some available dollars that would give the executive more uh, authority for the, the types of things that, that are promoting the one, the, you know, the economic well-being in the state so we could we need to work on that go ahead thank you and and known as the committee of flexibility i would we also you know i, I i'm thinking you know backfill if if you got the the funds of Nupa for three months and then we backfill it with this fine but you know we're as find, always yeah, flexible find a way. Uh, mr mr chairman and i think that's exactly right but but the question is I mean, if you if you took three hundred thousand out of Fenerpa to, to jumpstart this, you know that may leave the Fenerpa account considerably short with you know later in the biennium. So, I mean, we can work that out. I don't think there's a problem with that. It's just the, the that uh, as you uh, nobody knows better than this committee the assaults and 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 you know where it's a, it's a many it's a it's a there's a lot of fronts on this war that we're fighting and 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 it. And so, um, like I say, we do have we do have money squirreled away that we've done in the past to fight some of these battles, but there are significant sideboards on those battles. And so, sure. you know, another like you said, another way is to simply loosen or grant additional discretion uh, about how how some of that the war chests can be used. 
Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would flag that if, if a county right now came to us and asked for FNERPA dollars for the federal natural resource um, on a state compact issue um, that isn't necessarily a federal action, um, I don't know that we would, our, our current guidelines that for what we've told the counties is we, you know, we try not to be too creative using what you set in, out in statute. So if you, if we wanted to change that account to the natural resources policy account, that would be a great discussion. I'm sure our counties would appreciate it too. But right now with FINERPA, it's, we, we relate that to federal lands or federal management. You could maybe, you know, there, there's certainly an argument to be made that the Bureau of Reclamation plays a large role in the, in the management of the Colorado River and the Department of Interior. But again, we we try not to be too creative. So just just so you know that know that. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> we're just running, we're chasing our tail. Okay, Representative Stiff. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Director Gephardt, in connection with filling that position and. I would urge you not to relocate the position back to Cheyenne and <laughs> Green River is a very nice place. And if you need your applicants to have someone show them what a great place Sweetwater County can be, you just please call. Thank you. I will, I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to number nine. Oh, Don, I'm sorry. You got the numbers for us? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize. I, the 275 was, uh, maybe an overstatement. The highest direct distribution is 129. The highest um, county consensus and direct distribution is about 320. 320. Well, that's, that's when consensus was... Was high. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one more uh, housekeeping item, and that is also on the same uh, letter uh, with respect to the direct distribution for local governments, letter number seven. Um, we're interpreting that letter to be uh, 26... Um, 0.25 million. Okay. All right, please proceed. Letter number nine, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we move off of letter number eight, uh, would this be biennialized ongoing one time? What is the plan? I didn't read it in here, but I may have missed it. I think it was one time. I think, I think, I think, uh, Oh, Mr. Chairman, one time. Yeah. one time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, yeah, I think he said it's it's the beginning of a one time times one. So, okay. All right. Please proceed. Letter number nine, uh, Governor, is related to uh, predatory management or uh, predator management uh, that uh, through the state programs at the Department of Agriculture and the uh, Animal Damage Management Program. Um, that we work with statewide. Um, so uh, the governor believes strongly that it, this is a time too when we again have revenues to take on um, the, these challenges that we're facing. One of the challenges the, the agriculture industry, which is our third largest is facing is um, an increase in uh, predation and, and loss to predators. Uh, you can see in the second paragraph that the US Department of Agriculture um, has noted that the value of statewide livestock losses in Wyoming due to predation has increased 40% between 2016 and 2022. So as we look at where we can um, make an investment to support the agriculture industry, and it also has benefits to um, our uh, hunting uh, industry as well, because the predators also have a significant impact on populations like mule deer, um, that uh, this investment we think is is to benefit the future and, and take on an urgent need. Um, Chairman Kinski, when we were, uh, governor was presenting um, last week, uh, had the question related to issues ar around um, the Department of Agriculture's wolf program. And again, you can kind of understand the uh, approach to how we that program is run. So this uh, proposal would um, continue to add funds to the, to, uh, the U.S., uh, the Wyoming Department of Agriculture's uh, program that it works on with uh, its local partners on the, the wolf uh, indemnification and management. Could you remind us what we're currently spending? So what, what is this? Um, what have we already paid? So I think we, we gave um, dollars to this before. It's kind of been one of the governor's 
um, just not projects. Yeah, and so what was the base amount? What did we grant in addition to it? And um, what are the totals with and without those? Yeah, that's right. uh, Mr. Chairman, Julie Cook, Wyoming Department of Agriculture. Welcome, Julie. Um, the director apologizes for not being here. He is chairing a meeting. He couldn't get changed. So he asked that I be here this afternoon to answer your questions. Um, the current budget for um, predator management um, districts in grants is um, a little over $5.6 million. Um, of that, the Animal Damage Management Board has set aside $160,000 for contracts with wildlife services to help with um, predator management, as well as um, $50,000 for um, livestock loss um, indemnity. So this would basically add $1.48 million to the $5.6 million. Is that right? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And did we add additional dollars that 5.6? Is that based upon a governor's request to increase what has been the base amount from prior years? Um, Mr. Chairman, this program has taken a lot of cuts in the past, um, as well as had increases in the past. And so it's fluctuated heavily um, in the amounts that it's had. But this would be an increase to the amount um, going forward that would be allowed for predator districts to apply for. So what's the, what was it last by any? With any increases, so the total for the by any? Um, so we're sitting right about, we're sitting right at the same as we were um, as last biennium in this. 5.6? Yes. Okay. And by, by any before that? Sure. See if I have that spreadsheet with me just a moment, sir. Any other questions while she's looking up the number? When I have stuck in the back of my mind, this thing was at seven. There's been quite a few years this number was at seven. But that's my but that's but but I've slept a few times since that's kind of what I was getting to, is we're kind of getting back to where we were. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um the highest that it was was a little under seven million that was going out to districts. Um we okay. never quite hit the seven million that was actually allocated to districts, but very close, six point eight, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as I've been asking, because I'm not reading it here one time, uh, biennializing it. What's the plan with this funding going forward? Um, Mr. Chairman, the request originally was asked to the amount of one point four million is fifteen months. It was asked for. Um, immediately, then it would be biennialized um, up to $2.4 million going forward. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Further questions on that? All right. Let's go to number 10. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, the letter number 10 is related to invasive species. Um, that, uh, following suit, uh, again, this is very much about um, how do we best uh, deal with natural resource challenges. And one of the big natural resource challenges we are facing right now is with invasive species, both aquatic and terrestrial. Um, John Kennedy, Deputy Director with Game and Fish is here, so he can answer any questions related to the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. Um, but it just the governor feels it's very important uh, if uh, and asks for your support of setting aside some dollars so that we are prepared for the threat. Because I think you you all have heard a lot of this testimony. The most damaging uh, aquatic invasive species are, are in neighboring states. So we are it. These are on our doorstep, um, and uh, we know that the aquatic invasive species um, teams that that do the inspections have found um, the worst. Uh, aquatic invasive species on boats trying to come into the state. So um, this is this is a, a very serious threat, and and uh, we've looked at the the cost of 
having uh, one of those aquatic invasive species in any of our big bodies of water, the, the response plan needed to that is very expensive. So everything we can spend, spend on prevention really helps us um, manage costs. At the same time, the governor does recognize that there are terrestrial needs. And so he's asking that uh, this, this have some flexibility in it so that if there is anything that um, um, it is a uh, very urgent need on on invasives on terrestrial side of things. He could use these same funds on that front, but um, this would be a reactive. And again, since we try not to be very creative, um, this is just uh, allowing some additional flexibility for the governor's office uh, to deal with um, some of the threats we could face. So if we just broaden this language a little bit, you could fund a, a water project or water research project as well. So it looks like you're creating a whole new fund within the office to address any type of invasive species issue, right? Mr. Chairman, that is the proposal at this time because one of the other issues for us is, is that Game and Fish Department has funded all of the aquatic invasive species response and that's being paid for with either Pittman Robertson. So, you know, uh, funds from um, firearms and in uh, or from hunters and anglers and the threat and the impact definitely would impact municipalities, agricultural users, irrigators, all of them. So this is a means to, to also set aside some funds here in the governor's office. So this isn't just using dollars from hunters and anglers to, uh, to deal with something that re really, by managing the threat, we're benefiting everyone. That only anglers brought to us. Right. So Mr. Chairman, there's plenty of jet skiers that could bring this to us. The, um, so how much is, does the game and fish budget for the aquatic 2.5 yeah. 2.5 million annually. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we've got a candidate. Welcome, John. Director, how are you? Good. Sam and Fish. Uh, last year, last two years, we spent about two million. We anticipate that that was the design. Microphone. Start at the top. I apologize. John Kennedy, Deputy Director for Game and Fish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, the question was uh, pertaining to the amount we budget, game and fish budgets uh, per year for aquatic invasive species. The last couple of fiscal years, it's been just a little over 2 million. We anticipate our FY24 budget at 2.5 million. So how much do we currently charge for, for example, if you bring a boat across state lines to be permitted and or, um, I'm just trying to think of if there are, if we are short of, of dollars, then it seems to me that the folks that use the waters or, and particularly the, for motorcraft could have pay more of the bill to, to perform this function. And, and so I'm just, so how much do, do we charge, for example, if you're, you're coming across from Nebraska or Colorado, if you bring your boat into, the, um, into this area uh, for that opportunity? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and this committee was a very large part of that decal program that we had for aquatic invasive species, and we thank you for that. Um, that $2 million, uh, $2 million budget, going to be $2.5 million, uh, is about 700000 generated by those decals. And how much are into, they? Pardon me? How much are they? Uh, I don't have that cost. Yep, I'll send that to you. Okay, go ahead. So, Rennie, if I if I may, I I didn't I didn't catch when I read the letter that this was going to be parked in the governor's office. I just assumed it would go to uh, Game and Fish because they've got a program stood up. And I appreciate your explanation. Um, looking at irrigation districts, municipality, to anybody that uses water that would be diverted from a from a water source. But if it's going in the governor's office, how how do you have a who's going to administer that? How's that going to be stood up, Mr. Chairman? The concept that we're looking at again is is that it's the, the flexibility could exist between taking on an aquatic threat versus a terrestrial threat. So by choosing game and fish at this point, that would be focusing on the aquatic. Um, so the, the the governor's office. We're hoping that it maintains the flexibility that we would either work through B11 to move it, or we would be working with them to do the contracting. Or if it turns out to be a terrestrial threat that we're trying to manage, we might be working with 
Department of Agriculture and Wheaton Pest. Um, so uh, Thank you. that's the approach. Maybe bird flu too. So Representative Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So on the terrestrial threats, and I'm not, uh, my memory is not what it used to be, but my recollection is that the Department of Agriculture is the only program the state has and they do that with YDOT for highways. And so, but the terrestrial threat is bigger than just on highways. So do you have any idea how you would disperse that money? Weed and pest. Mr. Chairman, weed and pest is definitely one of the options. And the Wildlife Natural Resource Trust is also helping us with terrestrial invasive species as well. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a few different programs. Um, Game and Fish uh, does terrestrial invasive species management as well. Yes, we do, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, just, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I used to do this all the time and see Director <laughs> Nesbitt doesn't let me out anymore. So, uh, uh, we currently have an extensive budget for for invasive species, terrestrial invasive species. In fact, in the budget that we went over with you last week, um, we had just under 500,000 that we have dedicated to invasive terrestrial invasive species. Mm -hmm. So that focuses on cheatgrass, ventanata, and medusa head for the most part. Primarily on game and fish properties. Pardon me? On game and fish properties. That's on and off yeah. game and fish properties. So, um, those dollars, along with the, the dollars that Rennie just mentioned, WWNRT, which is also significant on terrestrial invasive species, um, that helps with the, that account that you're talking about, Representative Schwartz. And Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I do have answers to that decal. I lost it. <laughs> and it's a good thing, Dir Director Westby just helped me with this. It's a good thing, because I knew I would have got one thing a little bit goofed up on the non-motorized. <laughs> so <laughs> the costs for the decal are $10 for motorized watercraft registered in Wyoming, uh, $30 for motorized watercraft registered in other states, $5 for non-motorized watercraft owned by Wyoming residents, and $15 for non-motorized watercraft owned by non-residents. Okay, that rings a bell. All right. And thank you for confirming that my memory is not what it used to be. Representative <laughs> Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so I understand uh, all that we're doing, you know, to minimize the uh, species on the watercraft. What about the, you know, the trailer and the, uh, you know, the vehicle that pulls the craft? And they, you know, they get back into the water and, uh, you know, let it let it out, and then and then they come back and get it and take away with it and drive up and down the highway. Do we have any reason to to worry about that, Mr. Chairman, Representative? We do. Um, very hard for us to um, not only enforce but just to monitor that. Um, the one good thing is, though, with heavy equipment operators, for example, we often are able to even on private entities get language in our contracts and our work with them that they will check for terrestrial invasive species. Um, again, I think it's really, really hard for us to find and to track, um, but it can be brought in from a no number of different vectors. You're right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I, I guess this question to Director Bud back there, you guys do a lot of terrestrial invasive species stuff as well as aquatic species. You're not limited by agency or jurisdiction who you can work with to uh, work on these, are you? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, we uh, cooperate with county weed and pest districts, conservation districts, game and fish department, uh, federal agencies across the state to do uh, terrestrial invasives. And generally, we're picking up somewhere between 20 and 50% of the cost for primarily initial attack. We don't do the maintenance work, but if you look at uh, cheatgrass, Medusa head, Ventanata, where they first come in, we invest very heavily in getting that knocked back so that it doesn't expand. The same is true with Russian olive, salt cedar, a uh, variety of species. So uh, yes, we, we invest 
millions per year in, in, in supplemental funding that matches funding from other entities like Game and Fish and County Weed and Pest Districts. So do you, do you have the figures of what you, how much are you investing? Mr. Chairman, I'll have to get back with you on that to give you an exact figure, but it's, uh, it's probably in the ballpark of 2 million a year. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just uh, wait, 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 wait. No, no. I was going to Dave. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Name. But... Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm still trying to figure out the microphones. Uh, my question is: the expertise is with game and fish and such. Um, why don't we expand their authority to chase after the, the species where they are? I'm, I'm trying to figure out the rationalization of, of, of a new fund in the governor's office when the expertise is with other agencies. Mr. Chairman, the concept here is, is because we, we want to be ready for kind of either threat, both aquatic or terrestrial. And Game and Fish, yes, and WWNRT have um, the ability on the terrestrial. So does Weed and Pest. Um, so could state lands. So the idea is, is that if you put it in the governor's office, we have the maximum flexibility to take on the threat where it emerges because it could be terrestrial, it could be aquatic, and it could be on state lands, it could be on state parks lands, it could be on private land. And so depending on which one of those, it, 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 we wanna maintain the maximum flexibility of where we put, the, where we would respond to the threat where we see it. Okay, further questions? Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, again, one time ongoing biennialized, what's the plan? Mr. Chairman, the proposal here is one time, and, and uh, just to specify, uh, if you can create the language that it doesn't revert at the end of this uh, biennium, um, that would be one option to create that fund. Because again, we're, we we want to meet this threat when it happens, um, but we could also come back to you in the standard if we haven't used any of it to say uh, would would like um, a continuation of it. But the, the issue is is that the governor wanted to ask you all to help him be prepared for this threat um, if it, it is what emerges. Mr. Chairman, and the only thing I would add that maybe put a little bow on this is there are there are the there are already contingency plans to what happens if it hits various bodies of water. Um, for example, you take Glendo. Right now we know that there's aquatic invasive species just a few miles downstream from Glendo in, in Nebraska. If that goes to Glendo and you look at the plan and the effect that that has on that on the reservoir about the immediate first, the first immediate impact is maybe six weeks of no boating, um, no fishing. You're gonna, you're, I mean, you look at that, and I, you might just take a look. And we could, and we can even get to you, just one of one of one of the contingency plans. What that in, what that looks like, and it's not just you go in and squirt some stuff in the water and that's it. You're shutting the place down. You're killing the wildlife. You're killing the. You're killing everything. You're killing all the fish. These are big deals. And, and you, you look at a community like Glendo and you shut Glendo down for six weeks in summertime. It has tremendous, and so these are, you know, as you look at this, this isn't just, I mean, these are serious threats and we, we, we've been incredibly lucky so far, but we continue to have these, particularly in at least aquatic invasive species are, are getting closer to the borders all the time. And so pick your, pick your body of water where your people in your communities recreate or where they irrigate or other things like that. And these, these, you know, it, it will be, and the, it'll be, it'll be very significant. And if you'd have, we'd be happy to, it is not hard to find those plans. We'd be happy to get you one or two to look at just, just so you can kind of get your mind around the scope of what the reaction will be if this happens. Okay, further questions? Seeing none, let's go to the next letter. 10, I believe. Mr. Oh, 11, Chairman. I'm sorry, 11. Speaking of, of emergency, uh, emerging threats, um, I, I, those of you in the um, agriculture community um, know uh, um, that brucellosis has always been a challenge here, but it, at this point, um, over the last couple of months, we're seeing some, um, some, some different challenges that seem to be emerging related to brucellosis in Wyoming, and um, th this I think for the governor really meets the intent of these letters. And that is um, after he submits his budget, uh, as we see 
um, I don't know if th this takes shape and the, the detail around this is still uh, evolving. But right now, um, we're gonna working with the Livestock Board and uh, Director True, um, want to be, uh, again, prepared to deal with uh, brucellosis that is posing a threat to the agriculture community and adding pretty significant cost for producers right now, especially in Western Wyoming. So this would be to help uh, defer some of the uh, um, growing costs for brucellosis testing for producers in Wyoming um, and, uh, and help make sure in that we uh, knock back this disease and, and help, help this uh, industry um, continue to, to thrive into the future. So um, I think Director True, what Director True is here, if you've got any more specifics on the administration of how this would work, but um, the, again, this is an important one for us to, to try to take um, advantage of this opportunity to, to take on a threat that's that's evolving right now. So quickly, could you tell us what's evolving about brucellosis? Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> committee, Steve True, director of the Wyoming Livestock Board. Uh, what's evolving, sir, is recently a uh, game and fish on their hunter test came up with a positive bull elk back in the Bighorn Mountain area, in the hunt area there. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may recall a couple years ago that we rescinded an area of concern in Bighorn County uh, due to lack of any positives. So first thing I wanna do is allay any concerns. A bull elk cannot spread the disease, but it, but it can be a sentinel of what could be coming in the area. And Game and Fish, uh, Deputy Director Kennedy could probably relate that they're not nearly done collecting test kits from that area. And if there were to be a positive cow elk or a seropositive cow elk, then we would be back into a temporary surveillance area in that neck of the woods, which would require more herd testing from our standpoint. <clears throat> I can also relate to you that we do have one reactor in Park County, and we have four other suspects in the state right now. Suspects, most of those will turn out to be negative through confirmatory testing, but there's the possibility of more contact herd testing than we've done in the last few years. And we've spent every dollar of brucellosis tested money, testing money the last six years. So that's kind of the, the nexus of this, this question. Uh, on an inflationary or an economic note in the state that we're, we have a smaller number of large animal vets to do that testing. And the compensation that we pay them is minimal. My board has not yet reviewed uh, raising those compensation rates, but we do have two sets of rules that will be under review after a couple of bills that, that are on Senate file in this session if they pass. One is in the way that we will receive compensation uh, documentation from the veterinarians, and another is comes from Select Tribal on enabling uh, reservation producers some of the same availabilities to things that other Wyoming producers have. Worst case scenario, if they have a positive, then there's herd testing on that herd. So that's kind of the nexus of, of all of that. I do want to reiterate again that the bull elk is not an issue at this time, but again, he is a sentinel back in an area that was previously an area of concern, which has other states' flags are up and looking at us and seeing how we respond to that. And our efforts to respond quickly with more testing, both of cattle on our side, elk testing where, where available and their resources allow for game and fish uh, to keep some of these marketing restrictions away from the state's producers. And in advance of Representative Walter's question, I would suspect <laughs> that this could be yes. It could be ongoing, portion could be ongoing. We could ask for a carryover depending on where we wind up at the end of this year. We're in, we're in the testing season now, third work now. So we, we could very well have a few more that we have to work with. Uh, and I also wanna note that the last line uh, of the governor's letter refers to collaborative efforts between state agencies. That would be us, Game and Fish and the UW Vet Lab. Uh, and their testing results. And right now they're catching, I think the provost told you the other day about 4,000 tests a day. They'll, they will test roughly 90,000 brucellosis samples in an average year. So uh, there may be some way for us to cooperate with them and help them and defray some of their costs in that testing. 
your prior last session, last budget session, uh, Representative Walters brought uh, 60,000 biennial increase to our pass through money to them for the lab to defray their costs, which at that time brought them almost up to square. But if the testing numbers go up exponentially again, they'll be in the red trying to pay for that testing. Okay, questions? Seeing none. Any further questions on brucellosis? Seeing none. Let's go to the next letter, please. Mr. Chairman, letter number 12 uh, is related to the Wyoming's Tomorrow Trust Fund. Um, so appreciate that, that this concept kicked off last year with $10 million. The, obviously that fund and that program will not go into operation until the fund gets to $50 million. So the governor's proposal is to take 35 million of general fund and add to that to get to 45. Um, and that leaves a remaining 5 million um, and, and his desire um, and has been since uh, started work on, on, on this area around um, developing workforce and working with the community colleges is to uh, make sure that the um, private industry, one term is has skin in the game, but the other is, is that they can help um, lead uh, these programs to where they see a return on investment. So if this is to have return on investment, the governor believes that you know, leaving $5 million, um, to start operation of this um, is a good indicator that uh, would, would show us whether or not um, private industry sees this as the right program as well. Um, so uh, it's glad to work with them. The governor knows also that um, you all are working at, at figuring out how to uh, develop some mechanisms so that private industry could make those um, donations to be tax deductible, uh, similar to if they were um, making a donation to a nonprofit. So the concept would be to try to, to, to make sure that if they're having to choose between giving to a nonprofit and having it be tax deductible or giving to the state and not having it be tax deductible, that they would choose to support this and that um, work on the mechanism to do that. Um, but probably more than anything, again, is, is that um, the governor also sees that you've got three great programs in concept at this point with Wyoming Works, um, and you've got this concept, and then you've got uh, Wyoming Investment in Nursing, WIN, um, and all of those are good programs to help fuel um, uh, that certification of people who are, as, as the governor pointed out, ambitious uh, in our workforce who want to do more, earn more, and um, help their family more, um, and help grow our economy more. So they've got that ambition. And so uh, believes that uh, on the right path with those three programs, and if we can align them so that there is a, an easier step for people who want to qualify and participate and get involved. Um, so he thinks that, you know, there's concepts of all of them that are very strong and just getting them aligned will, would be the most effective thing going forward. So that's, that, that's the amount of meat and potatoes of this letter. Um, but just to, again, I think the governor believes that we're onto something in helping to uh, grow the workforce. You heard from Lauren Shanefeld, our colleague in the governor's office, um, who is the executive director of, of WIP right now. Thanks to all of you for setting that up to administer a, a pretty significant program and to, to, again, kind of chart and work with uh, higher education and get that input from economic development and private industry about where to put dollars and how to best um, align um, and support economic development with um, workforce development. So um, that's the rundown on all of that. Mr. Chairman. Co Chair, did you have a question? Go ahead, Representative Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I know this isn't uh, directly related, but I remember from the uh, governor's remarks the interest that he had heard about from private sector individuals in terms of participation. Uh, would appreciate any uh, information on on the possibilities along those lines in terms of helping to keep this fund uh, vibrant and to grow it. I, I believe that would, would also uh, enable opportunities to, to, to focus the, the, the application of resources and training efforts around the state as, as things develop. Wouldn't you agree? Mr. Chairman. 
Definitely, you know, the governor has been thinking about this since he ran the first time. So the last five years, this has been something that he has been um, talking about with um, private industry and businesses around the state. And so, you know, knows how important uh, workforce is to the existing businesses and companies of Wyoming. So trying to find that that right link between these types of programs and, and being able to measure the uh, private sector involvement in them to drive our return on investment so that that'll, that'll be one of the areas that shows us we're getting it right. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Mr. Chairman, also, I mean, if, additionally, the governor, one of the reasons it's 35 million instead of 40 million, the, the, the goal is to get to the 50 million, which then that can begin to generate the, the income that can start to be used under under the legislation that was passed a year ago. So the reason it's 35 instead of 45 is the governor wants, in, in response to the good representative's question, wants, wants at least a $5 million um, by, match by private industry for that very reason. Um, and talking with folks in industry, there are people who are willing to step forward and do that. That's why this thing of, that's why this additional step of, of trying to verify and make sure that whatever those, when those contributions are made, that the, the contributing business would get tax deductions for them. So they get they get at least that benefit from making that contribution. So that, you know, we're, we're making there, that that's a fix. We just need to make sure that we've got the right fix and that it applies in the right place. So we, we may have to talk a little bit more about that if this continues. We need to make talk about, regardless of whether this particular letter is granted or not, that's still something we need to address. Make sure that uh, as we view not only this fund, but the other funds that, that when private owners make it, that they they can you know, so would qualify. Would it be a sales tax or a property tax deduction? The uh, federal income tax deduction is a charitable <laughs> contribution. <laughs> Go ahead, Rip Sims to Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Perkins, uh, on this five million dollars skin in the game by private contributors. I sort of like the idea of skin in the game, but I'm worried that if it's if this is the best mechanism to apply it, because for, say for the Hathaway Scholarship, 15 years ago. You know, we didn't say the Hathaway scholarship doesn't go into effect until industry contributes fifty million dollars. It seems to me that it, because the in, unlike establishing a power line technology program where the industry has a direct immediate influence impact and and the industry can justify to itself that it's getting a return on its investment, this is more amorphous. This is more spread out, where it's more just kind of Hathaway scholarship for for adults. So my first question is: Is it really realistic? And, and then the second piece of that question is, as far as the tax, on the other hand, it seems like for the tax uh, deduction piece of it, it seems like maybe if you wanted to do that, you could do it without changing statute. You could just have them, industry give it to the relevant, relevant community college foundation and the foundation can, um, could contribute it to the, the program. I would think that would work and you wouldn't have to change statute. So two piece question there. Well, Mr. Chairman, and so answering the first question first, I think that that that's the whole point of the alignment and, and fixing the alignment is this shouldn't just be a Hathaway for people who are going into something other than the traditional college environment. For example, to align Wyoming Works Program, it's not going to be, a, you know, you're going to have to, to, do, to deal with and provide the ability to give grants for the Wyoming Works Program, which are not grants to individual students, but grants to, to uh, colleges and others to help stand up programs and get those things done. And they have it has relatively specific guidelines. So in, in talking about the alignment, that's that's one of the key key functions of establishing the alignment. So it's not it's not going to be just a scholarship program, but it's going to be an ability to fund these other programs as they've been set up. Um, as far as the other one is that I think that is also, I mean, that is certainly a way you could do it, but but I think the other the other I mean the other uh, vision that you have for programs like Wyoming Works and and nursing is maybe not a good example because I think every community college in the state has a nursing program, although every every community in the state is looking for nurses, um, so that's wholly appropriate. But in some of these other things, the 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 vision of uh, that the governor has with WIP and others to align those is is not to necessarily to have all programs available at all community colleges. Um, we, in some cases, that's wholly appropriate. In other cases, we need to concentrate those resources and have great programs 
at all our community colleges that may not be at every community college. And so in aligning that, the effort to have that program, you need then the, the, the idea of Wyoming, Wyoming tomorrow was then that money can follow the need as opposed to, you know, if, if it's stuck in the foundation, I have a hard time believing that we'll find a lot of cooperation from the, the, Casper, the Casper College Foundation in helping fund a, a stand up a program for Wyoming Works that may be at, at, at uh, Western Wyoming or, or down in your community, uh, Representative Smith. So that's, you know, as we're trying to get this vision, that's why this alignment work and not only funding this, but getting the alignment done is so important so that we have this broad, consistent, coordinated network of, of being able to train, uh, have a skilled and trained workforce. Okay, further questions? Okay, seeing none, let's go on. Number 13. Mr. Chairman, this is related to the uh, Wildlife National Resource Trust. Um, and very excited about uh, the progress that was made last year. Um, and also uh, the proposal that was brought forward by the Board of, of the Wildlife Natural Resource Trust this year. Um, so the, the, what the governor's letter details here is, is to um, add $5 million from the general fund to the corpus of the trust and match that from um, unallocated dollars that the, the uh, trust, which is a, a, a conservative board, has saved um, so this would take the, the trust from 190 million to 200 million. And uh, I think it's a great example too of the work that Director Bud has done um, in terms of, of working with his board to be ready to, to look at <clears throat> solutions to inflation proof this, this corpus as we go forward. Um, and I will just tell you that if you, if you want a good story, ask the director about the award he just received uh, this weekend. <laughs> Well, with that, Mr. Chairman, would Director Bud please enlighten us with the uh, award that he has been recently bestowed upon him? Mr. Chairman, Representative Walters, I was honored to receive the uh, Bob Dudd Goose Egg Award at the uh, Torrington Two Shot Goose Hunt. It was presented by the First Lady, and uh, there is only one of its kind. Uh, it is hangs in a place, distinguished place of honor, and I, I was quite pleased to receive that. Takes conservation to heart. <laughs> it's all about the baby geese, you know. <laughs> so I take it that the first two million of this five million will probably go to aquatic species. So. <laughs> so, Mr. Go ahead. I was waiting. To Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I, I, I'm fully supportive of getting the, the account to the full 200 million. My only question, and we're going to test my memory again, um, is that the income account, the projections were that it was diminishing over the next couple by looking forward over the next couple by any. So my real my question is, is that the best way for us to get to the 200 by taking 5 million out of that account. Mr. Chairman, Representative Schwartz, the, the income account, the, the history of this is that when the trust was created in 2005, there was really no mechanism. Uh, it envisioned a $200 million minimum in the fund. There was never a mechanism to inflation proof that if we had earnings above and beyond what we thought we would have. Five years ago, the select committee asked us to go back through, Representative Larson, you were on the committee then, and change the statute to where if we hit a period where we, our earnings were substantial, the board could come back to the legislature and request that money be moved from the income account to the trust account. Two years ago, we hit that situation where the earnings were fairly significant. In addition to that, because of COVID, the allocations were, were reduced. That left us with... Uh, what we felt was uh, $5 million was an amount that could be transferred into the corpus of the trust. We asked for that to be matched by general fund. That would bring the corpus of the trust to $200 million. I would anticipate down the road as we look at earnings and as the treasurer's investments pay off that this is something we would come back to appropriations with uh, 
not infrequently, but on a fairly regular basis and say, okay, we have the opportunity to bolster that, uh, that trust account and inflation proof it. So this is kind of proof of the model, if you will, of what we looked at five years ago when, when the select committee was saying we need to think about how we do this. I think this is, is a proof of the model that, it, that we can do it. And the request was to move that 5 million uh, and then add a, an additional five matching it out of the general fund. And that's great. And obviously my memory is once again, sus proven suspect. But I mean, for instance, we know that this year may not be a great year for returns. I, I'm not going to pursue it. I just, I don't want to jeopardize the income account and your ability to fund projects if we could just do another, oh, I don't know, $5 million from the general fund. That's that's where I was. Mr. Chairman, we, we put all that in. As I said, the earnings that we're looking at here came almost three years ago now. And so for a couple of years, we didn't just jump in and say, oh, gee, we had a great year, let's do it. That money accrued into the income account. We're looking at what our earnings are to date right now and where we'll be, and we're looking at demand. So we're tracking pretty closely right now. Earnings and demand for the current uh, year are going to be very close. Um, so we're not robbing the fund at this point. We still have enough reserve there to carry us forward, but we're very confident that the amount that we have in demand and the amount that we'll earn this year will be fairly close. Further questions? Okay, I don't see any. Let's move on. 14. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is related to the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund. Um, and again, this is very important uh, to the governor. Again, as we, we look at kind of enhancing um, our state, trying to have uh, strong, thriving communities. Obviously, the cultural, uh, the cultural uh, trust fund has, has put um, dollars uh, out that have really... Um, made for for um, that opportunity to have those vibrant communities. I was at a performance of the Cheyenne Symphony uh, Orchestra this weekend and uh, with my kids, trying to get them interested in, in uh, the, the instruments they play. And uh, that uh, symphony there is uh, has received a grant from this, this trust fund. So, you know, it's happening uh, across the state um, to do some really neat things for, I think, our communities and the culture and, and arts. Um, the governor uh, views this as something that's very important in, in an area that he cares a lot about, and that's uh, that's the culture and arts and, and history of, of Wyoming. His proposal is to take $8 million uh, from the general fund to go into the corpus of the, the trust fund. And uh, again, we're looking at uh, where we want to aim on this one, and uh, the, the board there has aimed for $30 million um, as a, an amount in that corpus in uh, 2030. And so we're, we're on our way uh, in that direction. So um, really just hope that if you did this, uh, that would get to 26 million. And again, kind of a, an area where um, I think the governor would like to challenge uh, private donors and those other people that share his passion for uh, the arts in Wyoming um, is just to, to help uh, get that fund between now and 2030 up to um, that $30 million figure. So this would uh, take this uh, um, opportunity in time with revenue to really set them on the way uh, towards meeting that goal and put that big challenge out to um, the public. So did you make a, a promise to say, if you go to the symphony, then I will take you skiing at Steamboat the next weekend? Is that how it worked? It's, Mr. Chairman, it, you, you know, it's exactly right. You, you got to reward kids for <laughs> <laughs> listening to an orchestra. I also bought candy this weekend. <laughs> Mr. Okay. Chairman. Any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. In its current model, if an individual or corporation donates or contributes to the cultural trust, is it a tax deductible from a federal IRS perspective? Mr. Chairman, Representative Sarah Needles, I'm the Deputy Director for Cultural Resources, and the answer to that question is yes, that is a tax deductible donation. Go ahead, please. Sarah, I was going through your hand out there. There was, there was a donation to Ski Patrol, and I was trying to figure that out. Mr. Chairman, Representative, I don't want to speak out of line. Uh, I, I, I will double check this, but I'm fairly certain that was for a 
a book that was written on the ski history of Casper Mountain. I thought it was the singing ski patrol. It, they, they may sing also, <laughs> not positive. Okay. I don't understand the question, Representative Larson. <laughs> Further Thank questions you. for Sarah? Any other questions on cultural trust? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Next. Mr. Chairman gets a little bit more complicated now. <laughs> um, without standing up and stretching, we'll just dive right in. So retiree inflation adjustment is letter number 15. So uh, um, we discussed this with you last week as well, but um, the concept here is uh, I want to separate these out because letter 15 and 16 deal with the retirement system, but they are trying to solve two distinct problems. The, this first one is trying to deal with how um, inflation has impacted um, the 34,000 pensioners that the Wyoming retirement system um, has with uh, in that system. And uh, in particular, I uh, want to look at the fact that the governor believes it's very important as, as he's um, in charge of the executive branch uh, that if we have an opportunity uh, like we do right now, and since it's been so long since there's been any sort of um, adjustment for inflation for those retirees, that he brings forward a responsible um, and, and st still very conservative um, proposal to all of you to consider related to helping to offset inflation um, for those folks. Uh, he does recognize that you've done um, great things over time, and, uh, including setting up the 457B program for state employees. That is not offered by every um, uh, participant, every employer in the in the plan, um, but it is something that the state offers, and, and uh, I think that has value, and it's part of the reason why he wants to focus this um, for those who've been retired the longest. So uh, Director Swindell is here. He provided uh, a memo to all of you uh, that we got out to you on Monday um, related to this proposal with um, the, the backstory to it. Um, but the again, the, the guts of it are that the governor is proposing a one-time investment of $68 million from the general fund and $34 million from the school foundation program. And that's based on the ratio of participants in the plans um, and that that amount, setting that aside over the lifetime of the, of the folks who are impacted or, or would receive the benefit of this, that is the amount that's necessary with a little bit of cushion um, to cover the, the, this additional inflation adjustment and benefits um, for those retirees. And uh, it, it is a finite because those uh, uh, retirees uh, will only be in the system for uh, a set amount of time. So this is, uh, again, does not impact the fund ratio or the solvency of the program. Uh, and uh, again, as we, I think we, everybody knows, um, it's, uh, this is based on conservative modeling uh, to come up with a plan that ensures that we do not impact the fund ratio. So um, you may have many questions because this is complex with multiple plans and uh, multiple um, employers and employees or, or pensioners from different uh, uh, parts of, of the state. But again, 46% are, are um, retirees who are uh, out of a K-12 system or BOCES, and then um, approximately 54% are local or state pensioners. So that's how we came to these numbers. Okay. Representative. Mr. Chairman, Rennie, do you have information on the percentile that state retirees tend to be at in terms of income distribution for their demographic group? That is, my guess is they're above the 50th percentile because they're collecting both Social Security and they're collecting state pension. And there are a lot of our residents who just collect Social Security. Any idea where our state, the average state retiree falls on the income distribution scale? Mr. Chairman, that's a very good question. And I don't have that. Again, to compare a state pensioner or a public employee pensioner with a non-public employee one. Um, I, 
Director Swinnell, I don't know if you would comment, but the other option, I guess we can work with economic analysis and see if, if there's any information we could come up on that. It's an interesting question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, there are some national studies about uh, retirement security in the United States. I think, as we all know, as uh, uh, private sector pensions have diminished, in general, uh, income for uh, people that don't have a defined benefit pension is less certain. It can be pretty good when the markets are good and their assets are larger. Uh, on the other hand, income tends to be steadier uh, of course, when there's a market downturn because the pension pays regardless of what the stock market did that particular year. That's the general flavor of it. Uh, I can try to do some research and see if there's anything specific to our state, but that's the general flavor. Uh, people that don't have a pension, whether it's a private sector pension or public pension, but if they don't have a pension and all they have is social security as a uh, ongoing flow, and of course, there are some people that don't even have that. Uh, then uh, in the end, they, it's relying upon uh, their, their state retirement savings or their assets, and that fluctuates uh, with the return on those assets. Please, go ahead. Um, when we get that kind of, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dave, it's good to see you. When we got that data, though, it probably won't reflect the fact that the state employee was also contributing both to Social Security and their pension plan over the life of their employment. So, I mean, how, is there any way to actually get to a true number? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Schwartz, good to see you. Thanks for your service as a uh, liaison to the retirement system over all these years. Uh, no, I, I don't think it'll it'll differentiate between that. There may be some information. It's a good topic. Uh, we may be able to shine some light on it, but no, I, I don't think we can we can account for the ability, differences in required contributions versus voluntary uh, deposits uh, uh, to, a, say, a 401k or whatever, which typically vary. Uh, corporations sometimes have larger matches when times are good, uh, less so when times are bad, and, and individuals tend to make that same uh, uh, assessment in their personal finance. There's a question. Mr. Chairman. Please, go ahead. Um, a, a couple of questions. And first would be, I, I see that this is excludes those that have retired for less than two years. And it says, uh, this is recognized. The legislature set up a, a 457B plan for state employees, but that's been in place a lot longer than, than two years. Um, has it not? Mr. Chairman, that, that is accurate. The governor's goal was not to align it and say when the 457B program was set up, that that from that point forward, there wouldn't be COLAs. Because again, that 450, we're dealing with 30% of the plans as state employees, approximately, give or take a couple percentages. So that's only available to state employees. And again, that's sitting around 70% of the plan are not state employees. So whether or not the 457B is available would depend on their employer if it's their city offers it or their county offers it or the school district offers it. So it, 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 is, it isn't a one-for-one -one concept that the 457B is a, equal to this. Part of the issue is, is that I think the governor is recognizing and, and appreciative of what you all did as legislators to set up a 457B program. And this is a, another opportunity for us to flag for those public employees, wherever they may be, that they should take advantage of a program like that because inflation adjustments are not um, are not common at this point. And, and especially if you look at fund ratios and what is in statute about when COLAs would exist, um, that, that is not something that people should be counting on. So if they want to be able to try to take care of and deal with some inflation proofing on their own, they should be looking at a program like 457B. But his proposal isn't to say, since that existed, nobody should benefit. Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. I certainly didn't absorb all of that. And I think the answer to my question was in there someplace. I was under the impression that the 457B plan was available to all state employees and all those other participants if they choose to offer that. Director Swindy, I'll 
You're the guy that implement. Or, uh, it was available in, in the 80s because I was there. Right. But, uh, Mr. But Chairman. It's available to there. who, I guess? Uh, I guess my Mr. account doesn't exist there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Hicks, uh, yeah, the, the 457B Deferred uh, Compensation Retirement Savings Program, uh, I believe, does date back to, to the 80s. Uh, WRS assumed responsibility for management of it in 2001. It had been with Treasury. Uh, the program is a, uh, available to uh, all state employees. It is also available to any uh, a governmental unit uh, as defined by the IRS uh, in, the, in the state of Wyoming. If that governmental unit chooses to adopt it, they can also adopt other 457B plans or other uh, 403B plans. That's another acronym for uh, retirement plans in, in the education community. Um, and so it all depends upon what the given uh, county, city council, uh, board of directors decides to do. Uh, today, we have about uh, 26,000 people that have accounts with us, and 16,000 of those are actively contributing to their accounts. Uh, so the program's grown. Uh, when we took it over, the uh, fees were 65 basis points on the admin side. Today, they are 19. We just reduced them again. Uh, the plan has a, a pretty good investment menu uh, with low costs and provides a, a variety of options for, for members. I would uh, take every opportunity to compliment this body uh, for the adoption of automatic enrollment for state employees in 2016. Uh, I remind you that a new state employee hired since that date is automatically enrolled in the program at 3% of wages, 3% deferral. And there is a, a match from the state, 20 bucks a month, but don't, it's still 20 bucks. Don't leave that on the table. And it has increased enrollment. The stick rate's like 98%. Uh, adoption of automatic enrollment is a best practice in that industry. And we are advertising that and bringing that to local governments. We're starting to get some traction from uh, places like Natrona County, Albany County, and several school districts. And I think it's, uh, they're, they're starting to pick up on it. So I think we'll get uh, increased enrollment there as well. Mr. Chairman, just one last question, and Please. not specific to this, but just trying to recollect what all of these, uh, all state employees are eligible. They're on social security also. There may be a few exceptions, but in this plan, I shouldn't say all state employees, but in this plan, all those would be also involved in social security, correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Hicks, I think that's correct. They're, they're uh, yeah, all state employees are in social security. In the retirement system, there are some employees in law enforcement, in the local community, and in uh, the fire departments in Fire B. Uh, fire B is, is uh, there's one department that is in, but all of those others, uh, the majority of Fire B, they are not in Social Security, and the Fire B pension is their sole pension. So, and, and the reason I ask that is, is my recollection is the Social Security periodically goes back and does inflation calculations and changes those benefits. Is that, is that, do you know that? That's my recollection, but I don't, I don't remember for sure. Social Security has a annual benefit adjustment. Uh, I think we've all read in the papers this year is it's because inflation has been big. It's going to be one of the largest on record uh, going back to the Reagan administration. Um, and what they also do is they um, use those same figures. When, when you retire, it's based upon your 35 years of uh, average salary. But of course, 35 years ago, uh, inflation was different and, and the value of a dollar and wages were different. But they plus up those wages according to those same uh, factors to kind of get a rough estimate of what uh, the current wage is. And that's what, the, uh, what your starting benefit is based on. So, Mr. So they do it two ways. The reason I point that out, and I think it gets to uh, wanted clarification on that, is what Representative Stiff. So there will be some inflationary adjustment for these pensioners through their Social Security program, also. Mr. Chairman, go ahead, Mr. Chairman, Director Swindell. If you know, what's the average amount of the typical monthly retirement check that goes out? We, uh, we know that pretty precisely. I have some annual figures in front of me. 
uh, need to divide by 12 for monthly, but uh, the average benefit across all these plans that we're talking about here is $20,966 a year. So call it 21,000. So it's less than uh, 2,000 a month. Mr. Chairman, so that means that if we adopt this full proposal, they would get an extra 300 bucks. Uh, I believe we calculated on average 311. Not a bad deal for 102 million. Okay, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I, 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 it's worth pointing out. It, it is 102 million is the present value of the stream of increased benefits that would be generated by the proposal. About 10 and a half million would go out the first year, a little less than 10 and a half, the second year, then down to 10, then down to nine as the affected population eventually passes. That, um, that, that payout is 178 million, is that? I, I think over, yes, over uh, 50 years, uh, 178, I think 152 over uh, 30 years mm -hmm. or 20 years rather. Most of it goes back out in the first 20 years. So, you know, the it, it's an intriguing idea, um, but it, it doesn't look like you've actually worked this through real actuaries. You're, you're, there, there's a lot, of, there's a little bit of swag in these numbers. Or did I get that? Is that accurate? There's a little swag, but I know exactly how much the swag is. It's 2%. Yeah. Uh, and that's mainly because uh, the, the funding sources were kind of round numbers. I can get it to exactly 102 million in the actuarial model, but then you wind up with a proposal that's 0.1502%, and we can do that if we want to. So what I'm the, curious about is, I've got a couple different questions, but the first is why are you doing this equally across all retirement funds? Because they're, they're, they're all different. And they all have different types of payouts, and they all have different types of um, benefits. And it's just interesting to me that that they're all thrown into the same bucket. It just has that appearance. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I would just offer that they're all in the same bucket and vis-a-vis -vis how their inflation, how their benefit has been eroded by inflation over the years since, other than Fire A, which is not included in this proposal, uh, none of these funds have paid a uh, an inflation adjustment since 2008. So what you didn't- So they're provide, similar situated in that regard. What, what you didn't provide in your handouts was the, basically, when and if they get to 100% um, going forward. I mean, you, you've ended in 2022 in terms of the, um, and, and so my, my point is there's just a whole bunch of data that we don't have that if I was gonna do this job or go through this, I would wanna go evaluate each fund and each benefit. I would probably take it back to five years or 10 years versus two years um, to really help the folks that need it the most because of that inflationary components. And so my point is it's, it's a complicated, and I think, um, in my opinion, deserves a lot deeper dive in, into how we administrate it, or uh, if we're gonna take 50 million or 75 million or hundred million dollars to make sure we're helping those who are in the greatest need um, in, the, in the right amount of time. And, and I appreciate the concept and how it's doing, but. All, all it does is, is, is throw up red flags for me. Every time I, I go down one rabbit hole, just, I run into four more channels. And, um, it's just a... Well, Mr. Chairman, I think you're right. It's a complicated proposal, uh, which is perhaps why it hasn't come to fruition before. Uh, it has been a topic of numerous bills, including uh, last year's budget amendment, uh, to do something uh, for retirees, whether it's a, you've seen the, the, the bills, 13th check proposals, various things have come up. Uh, you know, with regard to uh, the cutoff, uh, this proposal is a, has a, a two-year exclusion. You have to be retired for two years in order to receive it. Uh, that is typical. That's what uh, the, in 2008, when the last time that an adjustment was approved, you needed to be retired in 2006 in order to receive it. It's also consistent with what we do with the self-funded uh, COLAs, which have been available for members since 2015. Has not been a big seller. You have to take a reduction in your benefit in order to buy the future increases. Only three or 4% of retirees take that option. Uh, but you also, uh, those increases, if you do buy them, don't start for two years. It, it starts on your, uh, after uh, your second anniversary. 
Uh, the governor's office did uh, ask, and we have worked uh, other proposals. We looked at a five-year exclusion, for example, to further target the, the dollars that were available on those, and that certainly has some merit. Um, in the end, uh, this is the, the current proposal. Uh, everyone has suffered with inflation, uh, but certainly you do want to have some cutoff whether it was one year, two years, because you don't want someone in April of next year saying, I'm going to delay my retirement until July to get the COLA. So you do want a, a, a cutoff of some sort. And it's also useful to have some sort of ramp, I believe, in the benefit structure. And this small percentage per year of retirement does do that, because there's always going to be someone who gets nothing and someone who gets something. And you'd like that difference not to be too big. It causes political problems, obviously, that you're all probably more aware of than I am. Uh, and so this does have a ramp up. Yes, someone will they'll get someone that gets nothing and someone who gets a little bit, but there's not a huge difference there. And, and uh, that's also kind of a, a useful uh, part of this. Uh, we discussed other options to even have a larger percentage the longer you had been retired. Okay, it's 0.15% uh, for years one through 10, but maybe it's something different than that for 10 through 20. Uh, you can scale it that way. It makes it more complicated, um, complicated to communicate, complicated for you to understand, complicated for you to make the rest of the body understand. Uh, it's complicated enough uh, the way it is, perhaps, uh, but there are certainly some options. And uh, we always regard retirement as a shared responsibility between the, uh, the member, the employer, the state, WRS. It's also, therefore, a shared conversation as to how these uh, adjustments might be uh, considered. Further questions? So I don't, you know, I don't know how this will, what type of support it will get, but I do, I do think that if this um, does not succeed, that there ought to be a process uh, through an interim basis to actually to break this down and break it down by fund, um, particularly um, and and who the contributors are to those funds, as opposed to having all state dollars um, essentially put the bill. Um, some of these funds, you can take the judges fund for example. It has a nice retirement system. Um, it, you know, it it needs propped up a little bit, but it probably doesn't need. To di give additional distributions. I mean, they're just they're, they're all they're all different. But if 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 we want to go down this road, I think it's going to take a deeper dive on the part of the legislature. Number one, to understand the funds, those who have not been liaisons to the retirement, um, which I had the opportunity to do and really enjoyed. Um, and and it, it may be this committee. This committee is probably the best one suited to do it. To um, to actually do a deeper dive on this and get more information and, and the cost benefit of all these concepts. Um, and, it, you know, and, and to walk through that, the policy issues and the, um, and the costs of, of, and how to proceed to do it. And, and there, there's other ways to do this than just saying, okay, we're gonna pay for everything and here, here you go. And you get, you know, $5 a month or $30 a month differences, so. But I do, I do appreciate the concept. And the um, and it's uh, if we can help and if there's a way to do it reasonably, it, um, I I think uh, it's it's a good thing to do. So, okay, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Don? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just uh, consistent with my other comments on this. Um, this will be a $34 million impact on the school foundation program, which was not in the original governor's profile. That changes all of your documents accordingly. Thank you. Okay. So it's about 3.30. So let's take a 10 minute JAC stretch and we'll be back for the next letter. Yeah, let me tell you. One time. Yes, the guy was said I had too much personal.
Okay, um, we are back. Next is letter 16, I believe. Is that correct? 17. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're, we're about two thirds of the way done. Um, so uh, as I stated earlier, we have two letters in a row related to the retirement system solving two distinct problems. The problem that governor is aiming to solve with this letter is related to the fund ratio of the public employees plan. So while the other proposal related to inflation um, and its impacts across plans, this is only aimed at um, fund ratio solvency issues with the public employees plan. And um, multiple ways to try to solve that problem as well. But what the governor is proposing is, is that we do an employer, a 1% employer uh, contribution increase as an ongoing contribution increase, because that uh, has a very significant impact on fund ratio on an ongoing basis. Um, so the, it, you can see there's a table included here um, that shows you the uh, employers across the system um, and so, again, appreciate very much working with um, the retirement system and Director Swindell uh, to put together information. So if you've got other questions beyond, also he, he provided the supplement on Monday related to this letter. Um, but uh, just again, flagging that uh, the goal here is, is to uh, deal with the fund ratio and do this with an ongoing 1% employer contribution across all employers within the system. Um, as we look at the other plans, um, you can see that they are generally ahead um, and their long-term outlook is, is stronger than the public employee plan. Um, but the law enforcement plan, I believe uh, Director Swindell could talk about this more if you wanted to go into it, but the law enforcement plan is an area that the board is focusing and will be looking at over the coming year. So um, there, you, you'd have good questions if you wanted to have, ask questions on that, but that is something that the governor is expecting the board to bring proposals forward on uh, next year. So what, what I did not see is um, the current projection for reaching a 100%, I think it goes out to 2000, I forgot the year. And, and but Ms. the question is, what, what is that year? And then if we do this, so we're adding roughly um, 4.6 million a biennium, is that, is that what this does or is this an annual number? Mr. Chairman, it's 4.6 million per year for on the state side, 3 million general funds, 1.6 for the other and, and federal funds. And then the other employers outside of the state uh, get us to 19 million um, per year across the entire system. 9 million of that is K-12. I see. So that's a, and so all combined, all in, how much is it per, per year? Mr. Chairman, 19 million. Roughly with it. Mr. Richards has pointed out, sometimes I'm a little crude in my rounding, but approximately 19 million. And that puts us where in terms of when it's the fund is at 100%. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dave Swindell, uh, Director of the Retirement System. Uh, first question, right now with the status quo, uh, our projections uh, indicate that the uh, fund currently at 77% uh, funded. And just by way of education, a reminder, I think most folks here understand, but for folks that may be listening, what that is, is you take the present value of all of the estimated liabilities of the pension system, all the payments that we expect to make, discount that back to present value, and you compare that to your assets two ways to compare it. You can compare it on market value, just a snapshot in time, um, or you can compare it on actuarial value, which is a smooth value. You only book one fifth of the investment results in any given year. Right now, we're about 86% market, 77% actuarial. Actuarial, we regard as the fairest way to look at it because things will bounce up and down. This year, they bounced down. By the way, I think end of uh, November, we were at minus 5.5% across the portfolio. So things will uh, fluctuate. Um, so we, uh, the actuarial method is kind of smooths that out, and it's a better way to look at it. So 77% now projected to reach a 100% uh, in 2038. 
at status quo. If a 1% uh, contribution increase is enacted and takes effect in 2023, we would estimate that that would accelerate the year of full funding to something like 2035, maybe 2034. You gain three years, maybe four years. So at the cost of $19 million a year, we only gain three years? Uh, that's uh, essentially correct, maybe three and a half, but yeah, right in there. And it's um, the exact number, because I don't want to be as crude as Rennie. <laughs> um, He's Canadian. <laughs> we, we estimate that it would bring in revenue across the system from all the employers, $18,680,628. So call it uh, you know, $8.7 million. That number would change a little bit if uh, there's additional payroll increases from the local employers and so on could go to 19. So you can think about it 19, that's, that's probably fair. Um, the difference probably, one way to measure it, and we certainly did, uh, is to take a look, yeah, when, when is your year of full funding? Yeah, it's only three or four years difference. Um, the difference might be, well, those are still projections. We've had that discussion before. They're the best projections we have. We think they're as reliable as you can get, but they are necessarily projections. One of the things you can look at is what happens if you have some adverse experience and if you throw in a loss and it doesn't recover, uh, what does that do? If you put in uh, a negative 5.5% for this fiscal year and then you assume 6.8% from hereafter, that means over the next 20, 30 years, you're not averaging 6.8. Is that negative 5.5 is averaged in there. So you're averaging less than 6.8. And if you plug that in, that means the funding 2035, now you don't, you don't hit 100% in, in 30 years, 2052, you know, you're not there. With another 1%, you are there. Uh, it adds that much robustness to the, uh, uh, to the plan. And in, the actuar actuary's point of view, that's the more beneficial aspect. It's the robustness of the uh, projections in the face of potential adverse experience. They're just happier because they have a little bit chance of being accurate. Perhaps that's a better way to put it. <laughs> but obviously your, your odds are so, better. Rennie, yeah. right? <laughs> so Rennie, on, on this, I, I two questions, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, two questions is, um, I'm wondering why the 1.6 billion isn't biennialized. You, you say the three is, but the 1.6 of federal funds aren't. And why is, in, so that's my first question is why. And then as you biennialize this, is this from here on out just going to be reflected in the standard budget of the agencies that it impacts? Mr. Chairman. Yes. So it, it is a policy discussion for all of you. We wanted to bring this forward because the governor recognizes the importance of solving that problem related to fund ratio. Um, the decision about profiling the SFP and profiling this and adding this to the ongoing budget is, is one that would have to be resolved if you want to go forward with this. So the, the, the concept is, is, yes, the cost of this, this to have any benefit, this has to be an ongoing employer contribution or contribution to the fund. And it would have to be across all employers. So all of them need to pay for it. That's why we reference in letter number five, I believe, on local governments that they need to start accounting for this as well. Mr. Chairman, in our minds, they are. They, they need to be. Okay. You can, it doesn't say that they are. It says that the general funds are, but it doesn't say that the federal funds are. Go ahead, Kevin. Mr. Chairman, they will be. Okay. Special and federal, as contributed, those are included in the payroll transactions and billed to the proper place. Thank you. Okay, further questions? Well, I have lots of them, but I guess this isn't the time to place. Don? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the committee's um, knowledge, if, you, if the committee supports this um, letter, it will likely be a, a standalone bill in order to change the contribution limits for the local governments and, and non-state entities. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. John, would that just be for them? Could, could the state agency one be 
in the budget and the others, or is it best to have it all as one? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think it should, should likely be done all at once because you're really doing two pieces. One, the funding of it, that can be in the budget. And second, the um, change in rates should be in, in statute. Thank you. So just um, what I, I saw it in here, the percentages that go to school districts is how much? It's 52%. So about 19. So that's roughly um, nine and a half million a year. We'll biannualize it. Um, 18 million a year. So that would have to come from somewhere um, or additional funding to the school that the schools, I presume, right? over and above the ECA. Okay. Further questions? All right. Next. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, letter 17 is a bit of a budget geek letter. And so- Can we go uh, to double R, R or double R? Double R, double R? On your version, yes. So this is the cost of cost allocation to state facilities. Yep, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what you have here and, and to, to begin this out, so it, it kind of starts with the Thyra Thompson building, which is now fully online and and we and so if you begin the beginning part of the letter you we're, we're talking about the the estimated or these costs of the thyroid thompson building which are now pretty much pretty much nailed down um we're going to go forward with those but what's come to mind and you'll see this there's actually kind of two asks in this in this letter um the first one is about cost allocation so with the thyroid thompson building and then if you turn uh, to page two we also have there's also been an increase. The governor has has has, uh, has increased security both at Thyra Thompson and also in the co the Capitol Complex security. And so, um, as as these new costs come in, and so if you go to the top of page three, what you're seeing is that is that's really where the where some of the at where where one of the asks are or is to increase the number of security guards. We've we're now six times sorting security guards between the. Uh, the Hathaway, the Emerson, the East Hersler, and the West Hersler buildings. And so the governor's, the governor's installed those additional security guards. However, that, that leads him to read, well, that leaves us a little bit, we're two, two positions short in order to have those security guards. And so one of the requests you see there is, is to have two additional security guards um, uh, added, to, added into the, uh, the ANI's budget for security. Uh, uh, in addition to that, you see the second request or second part of that request, the total capital security request is $1,200,000 to cover the cost of, the, of, these, of this increased security. And so as we do that, one of the things that, and the geeky part of the letter then is how to recover those costs. Normally we would do that in the state, the state allocation cost system, statewide allocation cost system, which generally would result in a, in a, in a, uh, 18, actually about a two, two year delay to have all those costs and come back in. You know what those costs have been allocated out, but then you have to go back and recover it from your other funds like federal funds and other things. So in the meanwhile, general fund has been advanced to cover those costs while you're accumulating those costs. So the first part of the ask was again, the security guards and the $1,020,000. The second part of the ask is for a significant 300 series note. And that 300 series note then would allow direct invoicing for these costs at the Thyra Thompson building, and then also for the increased security costs at the Thyra Thompson building, and also then at the Emerson, the Hathaways, the other buildings in the capital complex that, that are mentioned in the letter. And so doing that, the idea is that there we would, you would then invoice for those costs as those costs are incurred and booked each month, A and I would then invoice the, the agencies that are out there that are funded by particularly federal fund or other fund. And so that that way we're pulling the, the federal fund costs in for those uh, quickly instead of fronting those costs with general funds. So it's a, the footnote portion is then to simply a conserve general fund, expend the federal funds earlier instead of later on actual costs. Eventually there has to be a true up at the end that A&I has to do to make sure that the cost allocation 
we haven't double billed in the cost allocations between the direct invoicing and the statewide cost allocation. But ultimately, this will conserve general funds and help us expend federal funds in a more timely manner. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that's the nature of this request. And so we're more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about that. It's complicated. And I'm sure that the state budget department and Mr. your budget and fiscal staff will work on, on the footnote language. Okay. Senator Gura. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chief, Mr. Chief Drew, I, I don't know what to call you anymore. <laughs> Mr. Staff, <laughs> COF, COS. Um, we had this conversation with A&I the other day. Why not security for the state office buildings in Sheridan, Riverton, all across the state? There's state, are the people in Casper and Cheyenne inherently more dangerous than the people in the rest of the state? And, I, and I'm, we'd asked for a list of incidents and I'm sure that'll be forthcoming, but I'm just unclear. I didn't have security guards in city hall and we get our fair share of cases coming through there. We had panic buttons. And I just, I'm, I'm just curious why these buildings in these towns. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think obviously the Thyra Thompson is a new building. And so uh, it's, it's, you know, that's there, I think, and going here and looking at the capital costs, the answer, the answer, I, I don't know the answer to your question with respect to the Rockwell. I think you probably refer to the Rock, Rockwell building. I don't know the answer to the question. I will get that answer and, and let you know if that, uh, what that case is. Uh, again, um, we live in a, we live in an interesting time and, and there are, uh, there are, I don't know if there's more risks out there, or if we just understand them more because of the news cycle. But uh, again, you know, we just have, we, we all have the responsibility to try and keep our employees safe. And so we're trying to address that, but I will, I will find out that specific information and I will get that to you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom, you go first. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just following up the answer to uh, the good co-chairman Kinski's question for the Thyra Thompson building, we brought in several agencies that had their own security when they were housed in their singular units elsewhere around the com community. Now they're all housed together and those agencies, rather than having one or two agencies paying for the security in that building that really the entire building is taking advantage of or, or utilizing, this just allows them to share that cost throughout all of the agencies that are now housed in that building together. Jeremy, I, I, I look forward to the, to the executive's response. With all due respect, I think that begs the question, why do those agencies have to have security in the first place? And why doesn't every office in every town have it? Why doesn't every elementary school have a security guard? Okay. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Uh, Drew, yeah, or <laughs> Drew, would you would you help me? So, in, in A and I's budget, we we see the the request to increase the security guards up to the same same level. It's the same number. Is the intent of the letter just to help us understand the enterprise system, and and to get that put in place? What what is it that the letter do that? What is it that the letter does that the A and I's request doesn't do? So I, I believe, Mr. Chairman, and if I believe, in, and I, I'm going to speak on this, and then and then the the mastermind behind this effort can can follow up with us there. If given, just feel free to jump in. But ultimately, the 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 the, the purpose is is to make sure what you're doing is, is an adjustment across the statewide cost allocation yeah. basis. Usually, we don't know what those actual costs are; they're accumulated, and so we're ultimately about two years. It takes about two years. Uh, to come back then and allocate those costs. You know what they are, then you come back and allocate it after that. So in the meanwhile, what you've done is you've, ex you've, you've expended general funds to do that. So this is a, this is a departure from current practice. And the, the reason for the departure again is to not use federal funds if we can draw down on the, the uh, federal funds earlier and there, thereby conserve general fund expenditures earlier. And I, the, the theory is, or the hope is, is that as you're billing each month for those actual costs of occupancy of the building and then pulling down on the federal funds to the extent necessary, that, that 
when you go back into true up, it shouldn't be very much different because you're billing on the actual costs plus the depreciation. And so the true up, you'll have to true up just to make sure that you that you haven't you haven't over 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 expended or under expended the drawdown on the federal funds. But ultimately that's what happens. We can expend federal funds earlier instead of expending general funds and then re, and then wait two years for to be able to to get the fed, the drawdown of the federal funds. And and then follow up. And so Kevin, we've got the enterprise allocation here in, in the letter. And is that already embedded in the agency's budget or will that be added in the next biennium as well? Mr. Chairman, the amounts that we're asking for in this letter are simply the allocation to special and federal revenue that are not in the agency's budget currently. Okay. So that's what we uh, wanna do. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Please go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, I'm, I'm trying to determine what level of security we need for each building. And I'm trying to compare, do we need to hire security guards as compared to just some sort of a, a limited access, uh, like a key card. Uh, so when the public comes, they push a button, they let them in. Um, so if we're just trying to keep homeless people out, which is some of the testimony that we heard from A and I. So has any study been done towards that uh, process about the level of security we need for each building? I, I, I don't think, no, I don't, the answer to the question is I'm not aware of a formal study. I think this is uh, talking to uh, Division O, and talking to directors, talking to the occupants of the building. It's, it's how, do you, how, do you have, how do you have appropriate amount of coverage for, for those buildings in the capital complex? I think it's, I think this is the, the that's the, that's the best coverage that we have there, but no, we did, there's no consulting. There's no, there hasn't been any kind of time of motion study or anything like that, Mr. Chairman. This is the, the best estimates of people who are doing the work about what it takes to have the appropriate amount of coverage and appropriate amount of response time. Okay, further questions? Seeing none, next, Governor Slavik. Mr. Chairman, this is letter number 18 related to the American Rescue Plan Act funding and, and in particular the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, we can recap that program, but I think you all know that program well. Um, and, and so I'd like to cut to the chase, if you have any questions about the amount of funding that's available at this time, um, approximately $120 million. Um, and the governor just to allow some flexibility for you as legislators and, and to potentially save some dollars back um, is bringing forward to you a hundred million dollars in proposals. So um, the the letter and the um, and other supporting documents kind of back up the the proposals. But on page two, you can see the table that outlines um, programs that were funded in Senate File sixty six last year, which was your ARPA funding bill. Um, and so you can see that some of those are are getting additional funds, um, and that's based upon, as, as you asked for, so you wanted uh, our justification for considering those. Um, and clearly, uh, one of the hardest things to do at this point is, is that um, to measure whether or not a program is successful or not as hard, because we still have funds that are just being allocated out the door. So to, to really look at it on the ground impacts is difficult, but what we can certainly do is look at the uh, uh, demand versus the supply. And we can also look at what we know exists elsewhere. In, for instance, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IJA Act um, provides funding to several of these programs as well. Um, but that helped shape these programs uh, uh, and proposals. So do again wanna thank very much we had the county commissioners represented, municipalities represented, and we had agency leadership and several of those directors are here. Uh, Director Johansson, Director Schmidt, Director Cooley. Um, we had Director Hibbard helping us out on the fiscal side of this as well. Um, 
and Josh Durrell from the Business Council has participated in this process as well. So that drove us to get to these. And um, you also, I think uh, Chairman Kinski brought up the, these documentation around the new programs. So we did not bring you an updated proposal on the on the programs you all funded last year. What we brought to you are um, an outline of the proposals for the um, five programs on page three, um, and also a proposal related to the uh, food insecurity system improvement um, that's on page two um, in Senate File 66 funded uh, study on that. And Director Schmidt has, has uh, spearheaded that work to investigate where we can improve our food distribution system in Wyoming. And, and so brought that proposal to you to kind of enact phase two of that program. So that's a quick outline of um, you know, what we have for you. Um, in terms of the governor's proposals, and I can go into detail, or if you want to um, discuss, we've got kind of the project lead um, on each of these, if you'd like to, to uh, go uh, into more detail with anyone. Okay. Questions on the airport allocation? I have one for staff. Please. Uh, Don, Elizabeth, we... This is the same thing we went through last year where there's multiple appropriations in a single letter. And, uh, you know, some of them don't have the same title, like shrinking workforce, I think is difficult to employ. You know, the names aren't the same. If you can get some kind of numbering system for each of these programs so that we, we make sure we're always, we can get the, the, the collateral materials in the, in the right place and, and when we're voting, we always know we're talking about the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, it looks like our uh, enthusiasm for questions is diminishing. <clears throat> so are we, at, Mr. Chairman, so are we asking questions on the, the request? Yes, we are. So I'd like to see if Director Schmidt could come up and help us with a couple of things. And we'd like, I'd like to start out with the uh, difficult to employ self-sufficiency program. I think I qualify for both of those. So, so <laughs> Dir Director Schmidt, as I, Mr. Chairman, with your blessing. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Director Schmidt, as I read down through your proposal here, um, I see that this proposal, um, it, it says that DFS is best suited for this. Why? Because of course, you know the answer. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Larson, my name is Corin Schmidt, I'm the director of the Department of Family Services. And this really is a joint project, but the reason for placing it into our budget is because we would be the ones that would identify the clients. Um, we right now contract, so to speak, have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Workforce Services to provide our work program for TANF. So we provide them with funding and then they serve our TANF clients that are required to go through the work program because they're on cash assistance. What this program does, what this, um, this proposal does is it takes a concept that has been piloted through the judicial districts through our child support program. So in our child support program, we know we have difficult to employ non-custodial parents. And as a result, those non-custodial parents aren't making child care payments, child support payments, and are in arrears. So a few years ago, we started a pilot through the child support program and with the Department of Workforce Services in consultation with Ray Fleming Deneen, who's one of the founders of Climb Wyoming. And she and her partner have been working with the Department of Workforce Services staff, our child support staff, to develop a more comprehensive approach to hard to employ folks. We're finding that there's some success in that program. We're seeing a higher return from non-custodial parents as a result. So what this proposal does is it expands the population and it also expands to our um, employment or our benefit specialists. And it does three things. First, it will develop a model of doing business moving forward. So this is a one-time funding um, proposal 
but the application of the, um, of the model will move forward beyond the training. The second thing it does is it allows for some research to do a little bit of project evalu program evaluation to see if really it does do what we think it's doing, to bear that out. That's been a conversation you all have had last year with us about how do you know it's successful? This is something that we wanna to try to study and see if it is successful. And then the sustainability is that we'll, our, our workforce will be trained, we'll have a train the trainer model, and then we'll continue. Okay, thank you. Then um, if you could, and, and Director Joe Hansen, if he's here, if he'd maybe come join you, I think that, that I need you services. There's a request to use $8 million in ARPA funds for that. I think the two of you, the two agencies have kind of been Mr. working Mr. Chairman, even with some. Before we leave that, can, can, can I ask anything about the difficult sure, to employ sure. program? Because yeah. I, I don't want to jump around too much. Oh, I'm... Um, so, Horan, thank you. In the last round of ARPA funding, we allocated money for employment programs and the purposes of those were a cut and paste right out of what was permissible, the guidance we got from the government. And so that was to the governor to parse out. There was something about prisoner reentry was one of them and, and, and some other hard to employ folks. And you may not have got that money, but do you know, do we have any outcomes data on that money? Was it successful? It was a lot of money to train relatively few people, but that's what it takes. Do we have any outcomes data on success or failure of, of those millions of dollars? Mr. Chairman, um, that, so there you allocated $10 million in Senate File 66 for those programs, and none of them have hit the street yet. Um, so the, so the, you allocated those with governor's office. Um, we took proposals for those in the fall. Um, the money became available in July. We, we evaluated the proposals that came forward in the fall, and those have been, um, when the governor then approved them, um, we're running those through to make sure that we have found eligibility, um, that, we're, that we're gonna be running those and only targeting eligible recipients. So there's, um, Director Cooley is, is gonna manage those programs. I believe uh, we've worked with the community colleges um, as well on those um, and there, uh, those programs. So we, we hope there will be dollars going out soon. Um, but that is definitely an area that we're we're waiting to see on in, uh, outcomes again. That very few of the ARPA dollars have have hit the street yet. There were a few programs that were set up in Senate File 66 that were based on a formula fund, and so that's where we it, um, the staffing stabilization or the provider relief. Those are examples of programs where dollars could move out quickly. When we did competitive programs, took applications, review the specific applications, then allocate the dollars then um, start administering them. Uh, they're all essentially just starting now. It's the same thing that's going through OSLI with, with those. So we don't have that data. And um, I, I think at the time of the, that application, this was not done yet. And so th this was not considered for those 10 million funds, but we did wanna work with Director Schmidt and the other proponents of this because we felt like it had really strong merits. And so wanted to bring it forward for your consideration now. So how do those applicants cross pollinate with the 10 million, the hard to employ. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll have to defer that to um, Director Cooley. She's managing all of that. And I don't know if we know that. Um, the one thing I can say is this is a current population that we serve. These aren't going to necessarily, I mean, these will be new clients that come in as they become TANF eligible, and then they're referred to the workforce program. So it's enhancing a program that already exists. It's kind of implementing different ways of an understanding that a lot of the, the people that come to those services have a little bit more need than what, than what a traditional employment seeker would have. So it's a, it's a human service approach to working with um, workforce, the workforce program that's already in place. It's the same program that also supports our able-bodied um, adults through SNAP. Mr. Chairman, follow on. I, I think. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Robin, respond. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Robin Cooley, Director of Department of Workforce Services. I think there is cross pollination um, with some of these programs. What we have before the committee being currently being considered for approval right now 
is a talent transition program that could potentially cross-pollinate. Although that is a marketing program more than anything to market some of the opportunities that we, we will have to um, uh, help individuals uh, that are in positions that may be transitioning into other positions, coal mining positions for one, for an example, that are transi transitioning into others. It's a marketing program more than anything. We have pre-apprenticeship program, programs. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of cross-pollinization there, but there's a possibility for that. But then our other programs are a child care workforce program, a targeted uh, health care workforce program. Um, and then there's also um, through um, Community College Commission, there's an integrated education and training program, which is actually a short-term credential program that is stackable. This could be a cross-pollination program because this is a program that could actually cross-pollinate with these individuals because these are programs that could are stackable so that as these individuals need to kind of, um, um, as life events happen, have to step in and out of some of this training, these are the programs that they could step in and out of are those IET programs. Uh, we also have another program, Adult Ed Over 25. Again, that's another program that is a wraparound program for some of these individuals, same individuals that are um, that will help provide some, um, some of the costs that for, uh, some of the federal programs will not help, help cover um, that, again, will cross-pollinate with some of those uh, with that program as well. Um, there's also a program to provide upskilling. Again, there's cross-pollinization there because that's exactly what this program wants to provide is upskilling for these individuals. So as, as we braid a lot of these various programs together, what we will be doing is making sure that we're not, we're not double dipping, we're not, um, you know, the, the, that there's an appropriate crossover with a lot of these programs so that we're not um, um, providing the same programs with, with similar dollars. And then there's also an economic development education program that's through the Wyoming Business Council. So there, those are the current programs that are going through that approval process right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, Corin, on page two of, of the right, excuse me, page one, two, three, four, just and I'm looking at this right up. I hope it's the same one. It says human services addressing wild drinking work, workforce. And, and you may you may not have written it so that you may not be the person to ask this question, but uh, it has participants 20, 70, and 50. Uh, Sheridan High Math gets me to 140. I don't know if that's 20 and 25, and then a different 70 in 2026, or are we still counting in that 70, some of the 20 that entered the program in 2025? Is this a unique number of individuals? Okay, each one's unique. So that's about $16,000, a $2.2 million comes out to by 140 is $16,000 per person. Is that typical of what it costs for these kind of programs? <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kinski, the numbers that we're talking about there are those of the populations we're going to study for the purposes of the outcomes. The program will continue if it will be implemented until there's a decision to no longer provide that level of service. So the cost per client will go down the longer the program is in place. So these are just one-time startup costs. Okay. So the, the services that the, the training that will be provided, the model that will be implemented will continue beyond the population that's listed in this document, which was just about that study population, the evaluation. Okay, Mr. Chairman. So if you could give us something that uh, breaks out the, the fixed cost and, and the ongoing costs so that, that I don't think it's $16,000 per participant, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, so I get it. And I know from things like Climb Wyoming that this population, it, it's not its not inexpensive. I hate to use double negatives, but I'm, I'm speaking to the chief of staff and he's comfortable with that double negatives. <laughs> and um, the other one that I, on page four, your metric is individuals entering the workforce 40% increase. 
do you do you have a goal for how long that is? Uh, you know, if they if they get into the workforce and bomb out for one reason or another after a month, is that still a success, or is, are you looking for six months, or or is that not part of the metric? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kinsky, I think that's a good idea. I think it is something that we can look at in terms of what is the length of employment after they've entered the workforce. Okay. Well, any number that you you think is indicative of continuing success, and then, Mr. Chairman, one more question. So <clears throat> we all know the fastest route to poverty in America is to be a single mother. And where I've worked on this before, and maybe this program's different, but generally it comes down to, if you're gonna get them some training, you're gonna have childcare and income replacement. So is, is that the uses that you contemplate for this program, at least in part, or, or is this a different, set of things, uh, aids that you're going to use? So, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kinsky, I think that's the beauty of what this program is bringing, this idea, this model of doing business, is understanding that the linkages to those types of services are key to continued, will want to achieve employment and continue employment. So it really brings a case management model into the discussion about employment. So if you mentioned CLIMB, that's one of the reasons why CLIMB is so successful is because it does do, they do a lot of work with moms to get them tied into those services that they need to be successful. Child care assistance is one of those. Um, so it's taking that type of approach and applying it across all people that we serve through power, through SNAP, that also have those same situations, but maybe do not participate in CLIMB. Climb is a limited program, so certainly they're 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 limited. So it's taking the climb model and training us, our state employees, to be able to do a lot of the similar work. Okay, Mr. Chairman, please. Ordinarily, I'm inclined to be very skeptical about these programs, but if two of you are tag teaming, I'm more inclined to support it. <laughs> Go ahead. And Mr. Chairman, I think you, uh, uh, Senator Kinsky, you raised the perfect example though, where there's a crosswalk between these programs because one of the programs that we've got um, currently under consideration is that targeted child care program. That targeted child care program could be the program that could help provide the child care for this individual so that they can then be successful in their employment program and then walk out of that with a, with a, a, a good job and go on um, to be successful in that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'd like to go to the high need youth service and if we could have you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so and I don't know who wants to answer this, but your reference in here, well, first follow off on Senator Kinsky. So based on the explanation, this is one time funding to set up a program. It's anticipated that this would continue. So it would be nice to know what you anticipate as those ongoing expenses and how many employees it's gonna to take to run the program. So that would be helpful to know what we're obligating. If we set up a program, the worst thing we could do is then jerk it away in two or three years. And so I need to understand what the ongoing expenses and the number of employees would be to, to set this up. But when I read through the description, you, you identify several things here about breaking down silos. Um, and I assume that was I'm not exactly sure what you're referencing that because breaking those down generates efficiencies. But on the second page, it talks about this is a similar approach uh, to an integrated approach with the uh, WIN program that you currently have set up and running. And um, I'm just wondering what the cost of that program was. But, but I guess the question that I really want to ask is if there's silos and barriers now, and you've already identified what those are, what is the limitation to correcting those now without setting up another program altogether? Obviously, you guys are already working real well together. You've got similar programs you set up. Why can't that happen now? without setting up an entire new program. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, to your first question about the number of employees, we would be training our current employees. 
So this is how our current employees will be doing their business from here on out. So there wouldn't be any additional staff. It's really retooling them, a training program for them to be able to recognize and understand some of the difficulties people that have some of the barriers to employment that some folks have. So Mr. Chairman, and I don't, I don't want to interrupt, but that just pops a question in my hand is now you're adding an additional program and additional responsibilities. Does the workload analysis, do your employees not have enough to do right now that they're going to be trained in another program and set up and implement that? Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, I think it's more what, in my estimation, what it is, it's more helping them recognize what the options are for employees. And it's just, it's teaching them and it's helping them with particular individuals um, understand, okay, this individual has these issues. Here are the programs that this individual can best um, uh, take advantage of and being able to then help them get to these programs and make sure they, they are taking advantage of these programs. So just similar to the WIND program, but I think it, it takes it just a little bit, uh, it takes it a step further in my mind because it does um, take them into that education program, um, but it provides a lot of those other wraparound services as well because these, in, these um, employees are gonna be better aware of those other programs. And again, I'll use that word wraparound services. It just helps them um, uh, ensure that they know that they all of the bases are covered for them, I guess I'll say. So let me see if I can characterize this in, in terminology that I understand. You're not hiring new mechanics, you're just putting more tools in the toolbox. Would that be an accurate analogy? All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, without referring to a metaphor, just let me tell you how I conceptualize it and tell me if I'm wrong or right. So ordinarily you go to this desk for TANF, you need unemployment, go to that desk, you need food stamps, go to that desk. You're trying to train these, these folks to take this person and say, what can I put together to try and get you on your feet and, and off the welfare rolls? Is that a fair characterization? Mr. Chairman, Senator Kinski, yes, that's a fair. So, so the analogy I have in my mind is when you go to the financial counselor in a college, they'll string together this program, this program, this program, this program, depending on your situation, sort of, sort of the same deal. Is that right? And Mr. Chairman, Senator Kinski, you know, the trick is, is that we're working across agency. It's not even within our agency. We're working across and we've partnered really well with the Department of Workforce Services and have picked into their expertise about workforce. That's not what we do. We don't know how to develop workforce for people, but what we do know from the Department of Family Services perspective is the human service needs they may have. So it's the connection between our staff, between the, and their staff to really say, this is, this is what we know, this is what we can bring to the table, this is what workforce services can do to actually provide the skill set that they'll need to be employed and then continue on. So it's a combination, it's a way to kind of blend what we do through a pretty, um, a, you know, a kind of a manualized methodical approach so that we can be consistent. And then of course, we can look at outcomes that much. Mr. Easier. Chairman, that sort of change is gonna be a big, big change. And so it, it's, it's, it's easy to say it's gonna be a, a big undertaking. So best of, assuming this gets funded, best of, that's a good fortune. Let me know if I can help. Mr. Chairman, one more point, if I may. This is also, please recognize this, this is a very difficult demographic to work with um, in terms of helping them and convincing them and following them to, to get employed. So I think it's, it is going to take a, a big work. Now it sounds more like Certain senators. <laughs> it's because my mic is off. That always has something to do. Are we done with that one? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I was going to, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I was going to go to the, the high needs youth, but based on the comments that Chairman Kinski and Senator Hicks had, perhaps. 
it would be best if we ask uh, Director Schmidt if she would maybe talk about those family resource centers as you talk about going for to this place or to this place because we have the two one one. And so what does this family resource center and how does it tie into what the last thing you two were bringing to us? Mr. Chairman, uh, was represent for purposes of clarification, family resource center is that the handout called Wyoming Community Access Network? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson. So I think the director, um, Director Johansson and I are going to tag team this and there's also Jen Davis with the governor's office. This proposal comes from the, uh, the health task force, but it is something that the Department of Family Services is in support of. We um, worked on the subcommittee that built this proposal. Oh, I'm good, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, so what if a family resource center is a concept about having a physical location where people who need services can go and whatever that service may be. What we learned through COVID was that we um, received, I know the governor's office was inundated, we were inundated with I need X, where do I go? I need Y, where do I go? What we also learned with COVID is that people oftentimes need somewhere to go. We would like to think that we're all technologically advanced and can do everything online, but there are people, elderly, um, some that are disabled, some that are disorganized, that really do need additional help in being able to navigate through the variety of human service systems, health systems, et cetera. So what the Family Resource Center concept is, is that it's a location in any given community where there are people there to be able to assist um, residents, community members with being able to really navigate and understand maybe what is available in the community and also help them maybe collect the information that they would need to apply for all of these services. Um, the, our office, the Department of Family Services in many of our communities kind of serve as that location but we do not know about Medicaid. We do not know about Social Security. But what we can do is help people collect their birth certificates. We can help them understand where they need to go. It's building that kind of response at a very community level so that people don't feel like um, they're not stigmatized by DFS and having to walk in, but certainly can go to a place that we would support so that they can recognize what's available to them. It could be a child who's in crisis and a parent saying, I don't know where to go. I don't know who can serve me. What's out there? It could be an elderly person, a, a, a child of an elderly parent who um, I don't know anything about what to do with assisted living or senior care, or helping my mother with Medicaid or a nursing home. So what this proposal does is two things. One, it creates kind of a technical assistance opportunity so that there is someone who can help um, develop this program at the local levels. The second part of it are grants, grants to communities to kind of build out in those existing centers now that perhaps exist or want to exist and helping them to get their feet on the ground, identify um, what kind of staff they might need, what kind of programs are out there and help them get them organized. So that's in a, in a nutshell, there's a lot more information. So I will certainly look to um, Jen on my left and Director Johansson on my right. Uh, Mr. Chairman. You have a question? I do have a question. So on a, as I read through the the write up here, I guess I'm curious as what constitutes a Wyoming community and how many of those do we have? Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, what the proposal says is 23 communities, meaning counties, but certainly there are a lot of opportunities. There would be other opportunities if there's more than one community in a given county that would like to apply or have grant money, seed money to do this. So it anticipates one per county, not necessarily communities that's county based. Because I would tell you, I come from a county that's got pretty diverse communities within yes. the county that don't necessarily always see eye to eye on things. And 
are constantly battling for resources amongst those communities within that county. And so I'm just sensitive to that issue. So anyway, that was my first question. So I'll defer to anybody else. Well, I guess the second while I'm on it. So we set up the program. How do you envision this to become self-sufficient um, for the grant program? And just an idea, or is this anticipated that this would be going, an ongoing expense through the department? Chairman, I'm Jen Davis from Governor Gordon's office. Um, Chairman Nicholas, Senator Hicks, the sustainability plan for this is as they award the grants, this will be a grant program, the entities will need to have a sustainability plan within their application. And then there will be the technical assistance that Director Schmidt mentioned to help these entities determine other funding streams that are available. So at a national level, there are a few other ways that these have been funded across the country. So the technical assistance will help the individual grantees assess that. What the hope is, is with these, is it's really very often a co-location of resources. So in some cases, we're not looking, they may not need any additional funding once they have the seed money to help them, say, co-locate a WIC office, a mental health provider in there, whatever it is that they decide to do, those entities are already paying rent somewhere. They're already paying for their staff. The idea is to bring them together in one location. So you have a one-stop shop for people to access to Senator Kinsky's point earlier so that people aren't going five different locations to get their needs met. So we will be working with them to get sustainable funding for ongoing. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so I intend to be self-serving. In, in my county, um, we have two relatively large uh, municipalities, um, but then I have rural Fremont dealing with Dubois Pavilion. There are 80, in the case of Dubois, they're over 80 miles away from those two. So I hope if this stands up, you'll take into consideration those types of challenges. Chairman Nicholas, Senator Salazar, absolutely. This will be a competitive grant process so the individuals will have the opportunity to apply. Um, with the proposal, obviously that doesn't account for every community to have a family resource center in it. So the idea is with the second part of the proposal that Director Schmidt mentioned is that having this network is so that there will be a point person to help communities, maybe even that don't get one of these grants, to be able to come in and support their efforts at the local level to help stand that up, talk about how they leverage their community partners, how they find funding at the community level to do this. So even if they're not a grantee, the intent of the network component of that is to have an ongoing resource that people can tap into at the local level. So, Mr. Chairman, one more question. Um, all counties don't have the same capacity for the ability to hire grant writers. So who's gonna help grant, who's gonna help write these grants? Chairman Nicholas, Senator Hicks. Senator Nick or Representative oh. Nicholas is gonna do it. <laughs> 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 he could if he'd like. Thank you. No more questions. <laughs> uh, Senator Hicks, uh, that'll be part of the technical assistance. We've already been actively working with the technical assistance center that will be able to come in and help assist communities. We will also be developing the grant application in simplistic terms so that individuals hopefully don't have a heavy lift in setting these up. But if they do need that support, and especially thinking about their sustainability plans, that's what we'll have the technical assistance support for during this time period. Okay, further questions? Representative Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so I like the idea of a resource center. My question is, uh, how would this affect or relate with, uh, say, a family that had domestic abuse issues? How would that interface with this? 
Chairman Nicholas, uh, Representative Henderson, depending on how the community wants to set up their resource center, um, that is something that they could co-locate as a resource in their center. So um, just for an example, um, one of the centers that we visited in Colorado, they have uh, domestic violence support on site. They have mental health support on site, child care on site so that individuals can get those services while having child care. They have a food bank on site. So again, it'll be community dependent how they want to loop that in. But even if they don't have an on-site provider for that, that would be one of the resources that they would be coordinating with at the, at the county level, since we have domestic violence supports in every county, they could incorporate that into their service delivery line. Further questions? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, perhaps now we could, let's go to high needs kids. Mm -hmm. Mr. And, and Mr. Chairman, if we could, Director Johansson, Director Schmidt, if you could tell us why these aren't in your budget now and maybe give some examples of success you've had in some pilots and ongoing concerns. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Stephan Johansson with the Wyoming Department of Health, uh, Representative Larson, this proposal that you, that you have uh, titled High Needs Youth, this is really an offshoot of a lot of the work that Director Schmidt uh, and I have been uh, partnering on the past couple of years to improve services, coordination, placements, and care for a relative handful of, of children around the state. Any given time, we typically have between 15 and 20 kids who really just don't fit neatly into a lot of the programs and coverage buckets that we have currently. Blown out of different facilities because of behaviors or violence, uh, we get a lot of, between Department of Health and Department of Family Services, a lot of facilities or providers saying, no, we can't accept or we won't accept this child. And by nature of that, these children are often in detention centers uh, or emergency rooms or other placements that really just are not appropriate. And it, it leads to worsening of, of conditions, decompensation, et cetera. That's the broad overview. Uh, to your point or question, Representative Larson, the, the main challenge that I mentioned is whether it's in Medicaid or our Medicaid waivers or a child that might not be in DFS custody, but the local DFS workers are aware of the case for a variety of reasons. Uh, Department of Education uh, can be aware of these cases, and we don't have the ability through various restrictions, whether it's on the Medicaid side or otherwise, to, to fund a placement or in the example of the Medicaid waivers. Um, you know, certain institutional placements are not eligible for, for payment. Medicaid can't pay in those cases for, for institution, institutional room and board. That leads to a big problem where we, we have kids sitting in, in detention centers or emergency rooms, and Director Schmidt and I and Department of Education are reacting. It's every week, sometimes multiple times a week. What is available, not only in Wyoming, but nationally? And often we run into uh, issues, not only that we're hearing a lot of no's from facilities, but that we don't have a, a, a flexible bucket of money that doesn't have the restrictions in our other programs to get creative and to, to find a more adequate or suitable placement than a detention center or an emergency room for a child that's in extreme need, extreme need multiple comorbidities, extreme behaviors, autism spectrum. These are just a few of the uh, common themes that at least I've been seeing uh, over, over the past couple of years. What this proposal would allow us to do, uh, Representative Larson, now really getting to your, to your question, we've tried to get creative, especially recently in uh, funding that, uh, whether it was from this body through flexibility or reversions that the Department of Health has had or other small pockets of money that we might have in, in the agency, uh, between the agencies, we've gotten creative to say this, we have got to move the money problem out of the way because the detention center is not appropriate here. We've moved some money around to incentivize community mental health centers to go outside of their normal scope of business or practice and work with special education providers, uh, retool some residential settings or a room to be hardened or to take care of a child and also provide that behavioral health support. Um, it really is a variety of different uh, uh, different ideas or, or 
pilots, for lack of a better term, that we have, by nature of reacting to these cases, tried in the past couple of years. In addition, uh, we, we stood up in the Department of Health a very, very small uh, room, a unit, uh, for a, an extremely young but severely autistic child that we had nowhere in the country to place. And I think it was, uh, Corin can correct me if I'm wrong, in less than a year's time, I think we had more than 60 denials around the country for a variety of reasons, uh, money, specialized conditions, et cetera. Uh, and, and we were able to, to do a, a pilot at the Life Resource Center to, to care for that child at, in a better way than an emergency room or, or a detention center. Um, and, it, and it was successful. We've discharged to a more appropriate location because we had that time to work on those options uh, and, and to find a facility, to, to bribe a facility uh, to, to accept this placement. And, and that's been successful. And my understanding is that case is, is doing relatively well in this new placement. It has a better chance at a more successful life. So those are a few examples, Representative Larson, that I think um, give me optimism. I'll certainly uh, let Director Schmidt uh, add her comments as well. I could not be more supportive of this proposal. This is a really unique opportunity within the ARPA funding that is behavioral health related for an incredibly disproportionately impacted population like our high needs kids. I think from an eligibility perspective on, on the federal side, this is ironclad, but most importantly, from a state uh, policy and service delivery perspective, this is an incredible opportunity to give uh, Director Schmidt's staff and my staff another avenue, another tool in the toolbox to use Senator Hicks's uh, metaphor um, to, to really improve these kids' lives and have some better options, whether it's in the state of Wyoming or, or outside um, than, than languishing in detention centers or emergency rooms. Further questions? Further questions? Okay. okay. I ask another. You another? I do. Okay, let's but go. But not on this. So, um, Director Johansson, if I could go back to your um, Senate File 66 and the funding that you used this year, you had some staffing stabilization funds that I think we, I think we've done this in two parts. I think we've done a B11 last fall to some real um, emergency needs. And then we, we went with this Senate File 66, we had the 13 million and we, we funded some more uh, staffing stabilization. I thought we, so what are we still lacking? I see that we're putting in another seven and a half million. Who are we targeting now? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, uh, so you're right, a little bit of background going back to 2020 and even into 2021. Um, using emergency uh, COVID funding that the, the governor had access to, you're right. Our first staffing stabilization program was targeted at hospitals and long-term care facilities. Um, and that was before ARPA Senate File 66 programming came into play. The reason for that was a, a phenomenon we're still seeing primarily in hospitals and long-term care facilities is recruitment and retention issues and the over-reliance and from my perspective on contracted labor, traveling nurses and agencies. We, we've talked about that a number of times over the past couple of days. Um, the idea behind that program, certainly not a panacea, uh, but, but some help, some emergency assistance was to provide facilities the flexibility to retain the current staff that they have through retention payments or incentives, uh, as well as uh, flexibility to do some recruitment activities. Uh, Representative Larson, in Senate File 66, the legislature expanded on that initial program that we had stood up uh, for hospitals and long-term care facilities and directed us to provide staffing stabilization funding uh, for other providers that care for priority populations uh, and also EMS, emergency medical services uh, providers. Uh, we have stood all of those up. All of those checks have been cut. The program is basically uh, finished, although we are still wrapping up some, some loose ends uh, and obviously the, the audit requirements and reporting requirements continue. Those providers that we've supported through the Senate File 66 programming are developmental disability providers, psychiatric residential treatment facilities for youth, residential treatment facilities for youth, federally qualified health centers. Uh, I might be leaving a few out and then also certainly EMTs uh, through EMS agencies. All in all, that was about $18 million that uh, was authorized. We anticipate we'll have uh, approximately a million dollars left over from payments that were rejected or providers that weren't able to attest to what was uh, required. 
this proposal, uh, members of the committee, from my perspective, the preference would be to go back to the early round of staffing stabilization and once again target hospitals and long-term care facilities. Although it's up to the decision makers, there's some flexibility on where, uh, where you might see the need from the health department's perspective, like we talked about this morning and in, in the health department's budget hearing, hospitals and long-term care facilities are still under very strict federal guidelines related to the pandemic and the staffing struggles continue. Uh, the, the vacancy rates are huge. Uh, we believe that this is another way uh, in this time to, to stop some of that bleeding and be able to retain the healthcare workforce that's currently working and not working for a traveling company or an agency to stay in that facility or with that provider. Mr. Chairman, then likewise on your provider relief, I thought we heard from you a couple of days ago, Director Johansson, that you had all of those applications in reviewing them, and we're going to be making some decisions on that. And so I guess the question is why, do we, what are you planning on doing? If we haven't done this first round, is there a need to do the second round? What's, why are we got that? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, we have made those award decisions. A lot of those letters uh, did go out this week following our budget hearing on Monday. They've been, they've been going out in piecemeal over the past couple of weeks for a variety of these programs. With provider relief, as you'll recall, that was set up in Senate File 66 to target providers who are at imminent risk of closure. Um, we set that up so that providers could apply for that funding, provide us financials, et cetera, that we make the determination on that. We awarded, I believe we received nine applications. We awarded two uh, for, for differing reasons. Um, you know, some of the applications were incomplete, some were not health and human service providers, uh, those types of things. I think with this proposal, um, mostly drafted in, in this process as, a, as an ability to carve out additional funds should it be needed, it's really difficult to say, Representative Larson, if, if there's imminent risk of closure right now, does a program that's stood up six months from now address that same concern? It's really a moving target, a moving dynamic. So in my from my perspective, this would be funding that is held for provider relief because we know those situations come up and the department having the ability to have those funds available in addition to our other tools like distressed Medicaid rates could, could be an asset. And I think ARPA funding is uniquely uh, you know, eligible from the federal perspective for that. Hmm. Seeing none. All right, next letter. Mr. Chairman, I just wrap up with a couple of last comments about that ARPA. Um, it, you know, again, I think the governor believes that these are a good blend of proposals that help entities survive from what um, Director Johansson just spoke about um, to thrive when you look at, at strong um, outdoor recreation economy with the outdoor rec grants that the State Parks Department is administering. And we saw really, um, heavy demand for that program from communities um, all across the state, because I think they see the, the opportunity um, with uh, developing those assets that can then be used to strengthen their outdoor recreation and tourism economy. So um, anyway, just do believe that it's a good blend of proposals. I would flag one more issue for you, um, something that's kind of changing day to day that you would likely talk to you about more in January, but as you consider proposals, um, as Congress now just starts discussing spending bills at the end of the year, I believe they're hearing from a lot of states around the country that the deadlines that were in ARPA for these CSLFRF dollars, the deadline to, to essentially obligate, have them under contract is the end of 2024, and the spending has to be done by the end of 26. There is discussion about an extension of two years on those now kind of kicking up out in Congress. So as the spending bills in Congress move around, that could be an amendment that we see. And it's obviously a consideration about how you do that. And if you want to pause and look at, at more outcomes and uh, consider that it, it, it's an option for you, the governor would be amenable to, to having that discussion about whether or not you go a little bit slower if there is an extended deadline on these to evaluate um, more on the ground impacts of the programs. So, so that's that's presume that's assuming that that decision to extend is going to happen between now and 
first of March at the latest, or, or, or is it theoretically logical to say in the event that that happens, that the governor has authority to slow down um, implementation of part of, of the, part of this, the, the last hundred million or so of ARPA dollars? I mean, do, do you have a position on that or something we ought to consider by Jan January, obviously? It's an evolving situation, Mr. Chairman. So we definitely, uh, um, it, there, there are spending bills being debated this week. I believe Congress just decided they'll be in session until the 23rd of December. So um, we may hear a lot about it over the next um, 10 days. Well, it's interesting because the Mr. Co-Chair was suggesting that JAC might go another week as well. So. Bah humbug. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we leave this letter, two housekeeping items. Um, the workforce programs, we just need to know whether that is Department of Workforce Services or the governor's office. In Senate File 66, it was the governor's office. The request is for the to move that to workforce services. Mr. Chairman, that it could go either way. The, the, again, one that that is probably the program that has the most time dependency related to it. It's a challenge to run a program like a scholarship program that those what are is moving ahead involves because you can't contract it. You're trying to get a, a dollars to an individual person who's going to school under the, the parameters of that program. So that is a program that it would really benefit from the extension. And if that's the case, then it provides a little bit more flexibility and analysis of where to put the dollars. The concept right now, Director Cooley can, can add, and we've got um, uh, Dr. Caldwell's here and, and uh, Mr. Durrell, who's got one of those programs currently. There's a lot to, uh, the concept right now is, is the 5 million would be additive to what programs are approved by the governor's office. And Director Cooley walked you through those generally um, just now. Um, so, um, for Mr. Richard's question, it, it, it's a little bit indeterminate, and, and um, right now we believe DWS is a good place to park it, but it could change by January. So, there, there's fluidity on a couple of programs. Another one involves what happens with the local government program that, that will be run by OSLI. That may hit a lot of water and sewer grants um, that were not funded um, in the first round of that program, but they may get funded here and, and that program and application period will be running through January. Um, so we, we're going to have, a, I think, need to talk to you quite a bit through January and into February as, as if you run this bill um, as it moves. So Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have an easy answer for it for Mr. Richard's question, but I would tell you I'd be back in January with a better answer. Mr. Chairman, I got an easy answer. Let's park it in DWS until the fluidity resolves and we can always move it later. Uh, okay. Apologies, one more. Um, on the housing, um, the materials say WCDA, the advanced materials said DFS. Do you have a preference? Sorry, but Mr. Chairman, WCDA, that the DFS advanced material was a mistake. Okay, okay further questions, Don? Anything else? Okay, um, next slide. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is, relates to the external cost adjustment proposal for K-12, and I, I believe you, you know this issue very well. So we're detailing um, what the, the governor's proposal that was in his budget message and also that you discussed um, when you met jointly with Joint Ed. So I, I believe this one's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, I think that's fair, fair game. Any other comments on... ECA. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, try to read this and don't find it here. Ongoing, biennialized, what is the plan after this initial 70 million from the governor's perspective? Mr. Chairman, the governor's proposal at this time is one time. Mr. Chairman. I believe that once you put an ECA in place, you have a commitment to payroll. So I think this is ongoing. 70.4, the ECA was revisited mm -hmm. one time for adjustments beyond this. So it would be ongoing. It's not that doesn't mean we haven't done it. <laughs> How much per biennium? How much per biennium, Mr. Chairman? 
I thought we recommendations. I thought we were seeing other places that that seventy point four would biennialize becomes one hundred and forty. Mr. Chairman, uh, continuing doesn't make any sense. Um, you know that you're going to um, appropriate it. $70 million for fiscal year 24, do nothing in fiscal year 25, it would come back in fiscal year 26. So it leaves us two options, one time or ongoing. And we had interpreted the governor's message to be on, um, sustained, which means $70 million per year. Per year versus biennium. Yeah, but it, it is an important policy decision, but that's how we had interpreted the, the uh, message, not the letter, but the governor's message. Okay, so sound all right? All right, next letter. Um, this is this is just the common school permanent land fund side of the uh, of a contribution. Of, so this is two hundred forty eight million to the corpus on the all the, all the arguments and all the discussion that we had earlier with respect to PMTF is is pretty much applicable here as well. And this is also broken down to two payments, or is it backfilled depending on when the money occurs? I, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, the request is to have this effective April first, and that would allow a portion of it to be on the third quarter federal mineral royalty distribution. So this isn't like the permanent trust fund where we're asking to have two distributions. This is subject on the distributions of the federal mineral royalties. And then we use the Craig estimate, the 248 million, that's just a 24 estimate. But we are asking that it is, is April because we might be able to capture some federal mineral royalties in that third quarter di distribution. Mr. Chairman, clarification from Kevin, April 1st of 23 or 24? April 1st of 2023. Okay, any further questions about that? All right, next letter, please. Then the, uh, the last letter, uh, letter 21 is, uh, is with respect to the SIPA. I think the, uh, the, only, the only amount in the SIPA right, SIPA right now is $1,100,000 and some change. Um, the governor has always contribute or thought about having this one checking, one savings account. And so this simply is a, a recommendation in this letter to transfer the, the balance of any balance in SIPA to the LSRA. Okay. Any comments? All right. We appreciate it very much. Any closing remarks from the governor's office? Mr. Chairman, we just, we want to thank the, the committee for their patience and, and their interest in the governor's proposals. Uh, Look forward to continuing to have the communication. We do have some information that we will get back. Uh, I think we've made notes and we'll get back to you with the information, the additional information items that were requested. And uh, again, uh, uh, thanks to, uh, we want to appreciate, we appreciate um, uh, Mr. Richards. We have a great working relationship with Mr. Richards and our state budget department. I appreciate uh, Mr. Richards helping point out a hole or two to us last night that we had a chance to fill in for you today. And uh, and thank the, the work of our budget department, our analysts, and and also uh, I I'd just like to extend appreciation uh, to our directors who uh, who uh, I think uh, do a great job and and understand these programs and have moved the state forward. And 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 thank you for your time and attention today. I know it's been a long day. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. And all your efforts and everybody else's. So. Okay, real quickly, we've got the state treasurer's letter coming up here. Let's see. Welcome, Kurt and Don. Um, let's see. Good to see your happy faces this lovely time of day. Um, the floor is yours, Mr. Treasurer. Mr. Chairman, 
I remember these days when we went to like seven, eight, nine o'clock <laughs> from time to time. So, you know, uh, uh, you guys are just getting started. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I think you've all got the letter before you. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is look at some of the turnover issues in our executive level uh, positions and uh, in particular uh, uh, in the area, uh, I believe, of our our uh, legal folks. And Don's done a great work, I think, working with uh, uh, the uh, uh, HR division in uh, A&I uh, to try to get some reclassifications. And uh, I think she can go into the uh, uh, those classifications because she knows that uh, a little bit better than me. And uh, I'd say, uh, uh, ask her to uh, uh, explain the letter in a little bit more detail. Uh, there's some other areas that we might go into, but I don't want to use a lot of your guys' time this time of the day. So I'll turn over to Don. Okay, Don, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. My name is Don Williams. I'm the Deputy State Treasurer. <clears throat> uh, as the Treasurer said, um, and as you're aware, most of you serve on the um, Select Committee for Capital Financing and Investments. And we're at the meeting in September when our um, General Counsel resigned as a result of pay was her primary uh, reason for departure. And because she believed that the position she was in was improperly classified. We agreed with her. And um, after she left, we did pursue reclassification of her position as both of our attorney positions in the office and were successful in getting those reclassified from a level four to a level five attorney. Um, as you know, with reclassifications, um, a commensurate um, pay, increase is, is usually required. Um, however, we do not have the funding for that. And this letter is a request for additional funding for both positions, one of which is generally funded and one of which is other funds. Um, the investment attorney is our uh, investment is funded with investment earnings. And in the letter, you can see $41,000 of general fund request for the um, general counsel and 43,000 of other funds for the investment attorney. The, the duties that of the, your general fund attorney are, are different than the duties of the, of the investment fund attorney, which is really a, a more refined, special type of, um, of function. So, and, and I know that no one wants to have dual... Um, salaries for two attorneys in the office, but I just get your feedback on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, as to why they should be paid the same for their, yes. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, because both of, their, both of their positions are integral to the success of our office. So while the investment attorney does focus most of the work on the investment contracts and investment related um, contracts, because there are some other things other than managers that are investment related, the general counsel is responsible for every single thing else the accounting system, OMS, um, unclaimed property, um, when we, you know, just so many multi, so many um, multifaceted um, things, HR issues. Um, I knew I should have brought a list, but I brought an attorney with me in case you want to talk to him a little bit about that. And so what Bill has been doing now is covering all of the office. And so without him, we would be lost really because we, we, we need both positions to be able to function because the treasurer is responsible for more things than um, just um, the investments. I mean, he is also serving on boards. This attorney, the general counsel serves as his advisor on these boards and his representation, um, WCDA, WRS, Void of Land Commissioners, SBC, all of those things. So it's very um, all inclusive and, and responsible for so what what is the pay scale for a, a level five from do you happen to have that? I happen to have that with me, Mr. Chairman. So the pay scale, the um I'm asking for MPP, which is the mid the mid-range, and the numbers in the letter do reflect they are inclusive of benefits. So salary and benefits for pay, MPP, which is twelve thousand eight hundred and sixty-one dollars a month, which is about one hundred and forty-three thousand, I think, a year. Okay. Chairman, please go ahead. 
questioned on the way this is broke out or <clears throat> is one of these positions general fund or one of them are other funds or both of them are split part of its general fund, part of its other funds for each of those two positions. I understand, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, one position is 100% general fund, the other position okay. is 100%. So, and I'm assuming that it doesn't ask in the letter, but you would like this biennialized, ongoing, and part of your standard budget. Mr. Chairman, yes, we would. All right, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Stiff. Yeah. Don, with respect to the investment contracts, they're treated as very confidential. Uh, and so from my point of view, something of a black box. Um, is it possible for us to get a peek at a sample of one of these investment contracts or maybe even just to the house liaison to the slip board, for, for instance? I think so, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking at my, my attorney, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, it would make a lot of sense for these two positions to cross pollinate so that oh. they both can work with those um, extent those contracts because the more we can do those in-house you know the, the more efficient the more better yep. job will do agreed mr chairman and that's why bill has been able to step in we also did retain lisa our previous attorney under contract to help us with the volume of work and because she does have that specialized skill in those investment contracts but the reason that Bill has been able to, to accommodate the, the lapse is because they did work um, in tandem to try to, to cross train in each of their positions. So that's what we would intend to do with. How long has Bill been in your office? Excuse me? How long has he been in the office? Um, Mr. Chairman, Bill's been there three and a half years, almost four. Okay. All right. Further questions for the treasurer or for Don? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, since the resignation of your previous uh, attorney and until a, a new one has not been hired is what I'm under the impression of. So that's three or four months of salary that has built up in your 100 series. Where will that uh, build up of salary be used or was it used for the retirement package as other agencies do versus needing to fully fund that position with this request? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Walters, yes, some of that money that we had appropriated for that position did go out for those payouts of sick and annual leave. The money that we're requesting here is just the difference between um, what we have and what we need. And, and Mr. And, Chairman, she was on, she was under the um, funded through the investment funds. Mr. Chairman, the fund. that's right, the investment earnings. And you might notice that the request for other funds is larger than the request for general funds, and that's because we needed to make up the that uh, that difference. Okay, other questions? All right, thanks for waiting around for us. Thanks for having us. Appreciate you your Mr. presence. Good to see you, Bill. Okay, Don, anything else? Do we have uh, one more? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have one more um, uh, public comment. And to my knowledge, only one individual has signed up at this time. Okay, public comment. Who would like to comment? Anyone online? Oh, good. She's been pretty patient. Oh, do you have $5 million per chance? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I know there's a long line behind me. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say thank you. My name is Erin Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Community College um, Wyoming Association of Community College Trustees. I think I almost said the commission. Don't tell Dr. Caldwell that. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes just to, to relay to you the priorities of the community colleges. I know you heard a really uh, nice and thorough presentation from the community college commission. And, um, and, and sometimes it's beneficial for me to get up here and um, echo what you heard from them. Um, they have a small budget request in the supplemental, but it's important for that CAPCON program. So obviously that's something that the um, WACD supports. But the number one priority for the college is, is still coming down to compensation. And I think you've all probably heard that from your community colleges, that ability to recruit and retain um, staff and, and faculty is still remaining to be um, the number one issue that they face. Um, for every level of instruction and, and types of programming, whether you heard from the Powerline program, it took them a long time to find that gentleman to come down from Alaska um, to other types of instructors. So that's that's something that's still 
So, so important. And we appreciate the governor's recommendations and hope this committee can support that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I also wanted to bring forward um, our support for, of course, the Wyoming's Tomorrow Scholarship. The governor recommended that $35 um, million dollars with the $5, five million dollars for match. Um, what's really, really key in that is the ability for the private businesses to have that, that um, the tax the tax part um, tweaked. And, and it sounds to me there might, might be some other um, opportunities and some other um, trust funds that we have that might need that same um, ability. So it might be a, a more broad effort. Um, I wanted to let you know, and I think Dr. Caldwell might have mentioned this, the joint, or excuse me, the Joint Education Committee also discussed um, the Wyoming's Tomorrow Scholarship, and they have a bill that's also running um, or sponsored by the Joint Committee um, to fund the, the scholarship at $100 million. So their thinking was going half a way big um, to fund that with, with $15 million available immediately um, to go ahead and get those scholarships out the door. So, so I just wanted to let you know, if you weren't aware, that that is also a vehicle um, that will be coming forward in the legislative session. Um, a couple of other bills that are important that I want you to understand because this committee has done such a, a deep dive in the community college funding over the years and many of you were involved in the, the select committee on community college funding and governance. Um, that, sorry, I'm having a, I have a cold, so I'm sorry. <laughs> kind of choking on myself here. Um, Um, they have two bills coming forward that deal with um, the community college funding allocation model. And, and one of those, um, we really did a, a deep dive with that committee, which I think was really beneficial for them because prior to them, your committee's been more of the um, area of expertise for the community colleges. And now we have the joint education committee also. So we have 15 more people who are really getting a knowledge base on the community colleges. So we really dove into how does that funding allocation model work? and the levels of instruction. We talked about House Bill 80, for those of you who are around when we passed House Bill 80, giving the community colleges a baseline and more of a um, certainty with, with um, their funding based on FTE. Um, but those levels of instruction um, were changed a little bit in that process. And we'd love for those levels to go back to um, where they were or more appropriately reflect the, the cost of delivery for the different types of programming. Um, and the committee was really interested in that, but where they landed was simply taking the lesser weight that's given to distance delivery. And so I just wanted to let you be aware of that. If there's anything that the pandemic pro pro proved to all of us is that delivering virtually um, isn't necessarily cheaper than, than in person. And so it's kind of a simple bill. There's no appropriation on it, but I wanted to inform you that that's something that's coming forward. Um, and it might bring um, uh, us an opportunity to have more conversation about that in the future. Um, something that's also important that's coming through the education committee, now our, our, our committee, our home committee, is a bill that will allow in the Community College Commission statutes um, for them to bring forward um, inflationary costs in their, in their budget requests. Right now, officially, and there's an AG opinion saying that is not the case. And as you might recall, last year, the commission did bring those forward and they were denied. And then that's where we all figured out that it wasn't really allowed. So um, the, I'll tell you, the, uh, excuse me, the education committee was really kind of shocked that that process isn't officially um, in the statute for the community colleges. And so that bill was um, pretty strongly supported in the committee. So I bring that up because this is where those conversations happen pretty heavily. And I thought you should be aware of that. So we're really um, supportive of those two bills um, coming out of that committee. And I know we'll talk about CapCon on Friday, so I won't address CapCon. Um, so Mr. Chairman, the other two things that I wanted to- So you talk about CapCon on Friday, you're talking about what? Oh, um, the, the projects that will be coming forward from the community colleges. The joint education does also have a bill dealing with um, um, the level of approval, um, the project authorization right now, which was set at $100,000 um, from the Community College Commission, the commission requested that that be increased to $500,000. And the Joint Education Committee met them in the middle and said, we'll go to 50. 
And so they do have a bill supporting that effort. And so um, I'm assuming that will be brought up um, um, maybe on Friday to just inform you about that more. So when the commission is back here, they can tell you more about that. So I don't believe the commission will be back here unless we have a recall, which would be tomorrow if we did it. Okay, I was, I was, Mr. Chairman, it was my understanding that you had CapCon on the agenda on Friday. Am I, is that not how it is? That's incorrect. Okay. Okay, well, now you know. How's that? Um, um, let's see. I think I lost my train of thought. Then the last thing, though, is you heard from, from um, um, Director Shane Feld, Executive Director Shane Feld today on the Wyoming Innovation Partnership. And I just want to thank you, this committee, and the, um, those of you who voted for um, including that position in the budget, because I think that position has been really instrumental in, um, I think, guiding the, guiding the ship and, and all of the, the players that were trying to, to make something of um, all of these ideas coming forward. Um, Lauren's been really instrumental in, in kind of getting us all going, um, and, and I think she's been wonderful. So I hope you got some good information from her, and um, we're excited as we move into phase two and what that looks like. And you've heard that there were already getting some really neat results coming out of that um, partnership. So, um, Mr. Chairman, that's that's what I have. Um, I'm just excited that there's lots of opportunities coming forward. And um, whether it's more conversations through this interim or um, into the session, I think there'll be some other opportunities to, to consider. So that's all I have for you. And I appreciate uh, your willingness to take some public comment tonight. And, and we have zinc and um, vitamin C right through that. <laughs> Our whole house needs it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Mr. 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 Chairman, uh, Aaron, you talked about a bill that would change how the levels work for funding. If I understand it, what you were referring to is that if if you teach English, that's funded. If that's funded at a one, then maybe teaching welding is funded at one and a half times that amount. And just in virtual classes are at like 0.75 or something like that. If I understand the proposal, you're saying that say virtual might go from 0.75 back up to one. So, but then you said that it had no appropriation attached to it. So, and that's the part, that's where my question is. It seems like if you did adjust the levels and you funded virtual education at a, you know, fully as though it were live, then doesn't that affect the budget? Doesn't that affect how much money you need? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, um, it's my understanding, and, and I don't have my, my backup crew here from the commission, um, it, it simply is kind of a re-shifting around because there isn't an appropriation attached, um, and that's why I, I think my interpretation is that's why they didn't do a deep dive into all of the levels of instruction, even like CTE type classes Senator Kinsky's concerned about is because it would require a pretty decent appropriation to really shore that up and get that where it needs to be. Um, so it was, we've spent two years now, Representative Stith educating this committee, and, and we had to start from, you know, really the square one on, on the funding model, how it works, how it's different from K-12. We've got these levels of instruction, what are they? Um, so we really are trying to take baby steps on how we educate and, and move forward with um, meaningful meaningful discussions. And I can get you more information. How's that? Okay. Any further questions? All right. Thank you. Thank Very you. Much, okay, Don. Um, oh, we've got one more public comment. So, anybody on Zoom while we're waiting? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, members of the committee, Richard Garrett. I'm just going to speak as a son of Wyoming. I was born in Casper. Um, I like to say I got to Cheyenne as quickly as I could, but I do love Casper. I'm a resident of Fremont County too. There's not a place in this state I wouldn't want to live, frankly. And I, part of the benefit of living in the state of Wyoming is to be re represented by fine people like you, like yourselves. Uh, several of you have been my representative or my senator, and uh, I think you all do a fantastic job on behalf of our state. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to speak in support of the additional funding for the Corpus for the Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust. That's something that the legislature can take a lot of pride in accomplishing and funding over more than a decade and a half now. Um, it's added 
benefit to our state. It's kept a certain bird uh, off the endangered species list. It resulted in a, um, a, a rightfully earned reward award for um, the executive director, I think it was the Bodud Award. Um, and it's provided jobs to our state. It's provided many, many jobs to our state. So I, I urge your support for that additional funding. Um, I'd also urge support for investment in um, combating aquatic invasive species and terrestrial species. Um, water is extraordinarily important to our state. You've heard for so many reasons. Uh, I hate to think of anything drinking our water that can better go to benefiting our cattle and our crops. Uh, we've got to fight these invasive species and, and we have to invest in that fight and maintain that fight too. Um, and then finally, uh, I've been doing a lot of work, as you all know, um, in support of healthcare coverage in our beautiful state. Uh, you might have heard this a couple of weeks ago that uh, one of your committees has uh, agreed to sponsor a bill that would allow the um, legislature, if approved and signed into law, to participate in the state health care plan. And I fully support that. And as I said at the outset, you all work very hard on behalf of our state. Um, it's something that we all need. We've all seen, maybe not as a result of their service, but coincidental with their service, um, legislators' uh, health deteriorate or even fail. Uh, during sessions and, and during interims. Uh, and so healthcare is something that's vitally important to everyone in our state. Um, I, I appreciated your conversation day before yesterday with the Department of Health, and I look forward to whatever opening that might provide um, for expanding uh, healthcare coverage in Wyoming. Um, I know I'm forgetting something. Oh, yes, um, there's a position that uh, has been um, advocated within the state engineer's office for hydrology studies in the upper green. And I would like to speak in support of that as well. Again, to our water, there's nothing more important to our state than our water. And it's becoming more precious every, almost every day. And we need a better understanding of what other states are telling us we should be doing with our water because they're gonna step up. And as the analogy was said earlier, if we're not at the table, we're gonna be on the menu. So. I'd urge your support of that uh, of that particular position as well. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Richard, thank you for tuning in and putting up with uh, listening to us for a couple of days. Thank you. Your service, yeah. I, I said it already, it's extraordinary. So thank okay, you. Okay, any Mark. questions for Richard? Thank you. Okay, any other public comment? With that, we will close public comment. Don, um, kind of walk us through the our duties in the next two days. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, you have four bills before you that you've received testimony on. Uh, the first of which is uh, the governor's recommendation um, for direct distribution to local governments. Uh, you received that in the form of governor's letter this afternoon or this morning. Uh, the second is a, um, a bill for the appropriation of ARPA funds. Um, with the reversions that the governor has put forward, there's approximately $121 million available in that pot. Um, and his recommendations in governor's letter number 18 uh, provide for the use of 100 million roughly of those funds. The third bill before you is uh, capital construction. That appears in uh, agency 227 of your large book. And uh, um, Finally, uh, the fourth bill um, before you is the supplemental budget bill, which is comprised of uh, the balance of the letters and agencies uh, before you. Okay. Um, so my inclination, Mr. Mr. Co-Chair, is that given the, the time of, of day it is, that it might be useful if the, uh, co-chairs and vice chairs would meet first thing in the morning and kind of work out the process and go through a little informal discussion before we go to public, before we, um, we go live. So I would suggest that we might meet at eight and then plan on going live at nine o'clock. Um, we... Well, I'm up at four. 
Well, it depends on so the You have quite the cue sitting on my bed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> that just means I need more sleep. <laughs> Eight, we'll be here at 7.30. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fine. But I'm just thinking that yeah, it might be change the meeting time to nine. Nine yeah. in terms of going live for everything. Just I just every time we've done this, typically we make people sit around and wait while we're doing our informal discussions. And so I just Curtis is your middle name. That would be my suggestion. So, I mean, I mean, we're still on at eight for the everybody, or set, and maybe perhaps seven thirty for, um, for the three, four of us co-chairs. But um, with that, Don, any other business for today? Oh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Kocha? I have nothing except uh, I and my committee are going to recess to a conference room and I to a place far, far away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. With that, we'll stand adjourned until nine o'clock tomorrow morning.